This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. One minute, please. Oh, always remember to switch the lights off. We ready for safari? Sorry, everybody. You know, sometimes these happen. Hello, everyone. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and, uh, well, on camera with me today is David, and welcome to the Sunset Safari Bushwalk. We're going on a walk. Are we ready to find some animals? I am. I promise. I promise I'm ready. Now, we've had some interesting things today. We've played cricket. That was a lot of fun. I won. Just thought I'd let you know. No, I'm just joking. That was terrible. Um, Geraldine got caught out twice by Amanda Chef. She tried to redeem herself and came back and failed too. Now, yes, yeah, nice, Jerry. For those of you who have never joined us on one of these wonderful interactive Safaris. We'll hopefully find you some animals, but you can talk to us. You can hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can talk to us via the YouTube chat and comment away on Facebook, and hopefully we'll find them. Now, <laughs> we're standing out here looking onto the drainage line. Just on the other side is Galago Pan, where squirrels, monkeys, Franklins have been alarming all day long. I wonder who's lurking just on the other side, but you'll have to wait to find out. Off you go to Rolf. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome aboard another Sunset Safari. You're watching Safari Live, and we're watching what seems to be maybe an African hawk eagle getting chased by a little forktail drongo. I think it was that, but we're only looking at the silhouette. Now, please uh, don't forget that we are in the Juma Traverse of the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. My name is Ralph Kirsten, and on the camera this afternoon, we've got Senzo. How's it, Senzo? Please don't forget to join us on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat. Send us your questions and your comments and get involved on the largest game drive in the world. Now, it is a lovely warm afternoon. A little bit of a breeze started to come through. Seems like that eagle has been chased off by that little forkdale drongo. And, well, we're going to start up again and maybe head down towards uh, the Twin Dams area as well as Treehouse Dam which is a little bit on the southern side, south-central side of the Juma Traverse. We are on the lookout, as usual, for all the normal, usual suspects, such as lion and leopard, as Senzo is sitting there listening intently to me, uh, because, well, we're always looking for that, but it's nice and hot now in the afternoon, so uh, it's normal that they could be just relaxing in the shade a little bit, lying nice and flat. There's a little bit of potential for them to be up in the trees we've got some clouds around so it might cool off quite substantially a little bit later but uh, for now nice and warm as I said um, we are feeling uh, the humidity a little bit but um, well while we carry on our search let's head you back to Taylor who's uh, got Zazu well Ralph you probably know this hornbill it's one of our friends that live around in camp and I thought why not introduce you to all the camp characters on this wonderful Sunday afternoon? So this is one of the yellow-billed hornbills that we have not named yet. Off he flies. And he's quite relaxed. I think he's just trying to feed in all the leaf litter. What have we got there? Picking up something. I don't know. Shall we see how close we can get? The ones that live inside camp are really quite entertaining because, like I said this morning, you literally have to step on their tail feathers for them to fly away. Maybe this hornbill's not from here. Perhaps I've just mistaken him for someone else. Hello. Oh, there's the other one. Yes, and actually I've just said the same thing to David about Esmeralda, the, spotted, the emerald spotted wood dove. Remember, we were talking about her. She was at the car park not so long ago, so we're going to see if we can find her too, because she or he, they're very relaxed. Hello, little hornbill. You see. Oh, and there's the red-billed hornbill too, so we've got both species. But no partners today. Normally we see them in pairs. So there's about f four to six of them that fly around and chase one another. Like I said, they go for the disco ball very, very often. Perhaps we'll have to show you the disco ball. 
That might be a good one. We might find Esmeralda at the fire pit preparing the bonfire for tonight. Now, <clears throat> they've recently just cleared that area. <laughs> Malaka, we are lucky, and I'm sure you're pretty envious. Uh, there is literally just wildlife everywhere. Like I said, Hukumori was, he was probably only a couple of meters away from, uh, from those rooms that I was, well, it wasn't even my room that I was in either. It was Kirsten's room. <laughs> we just hijacked it. But look at this. Hello. I mean, when we're out there, we don't normally get to get this close to the animals on foot. And they recently just cleared here. I think they're going to do a bit of bit of uh, work on the fence line. So it's made for a perfect spot. The soil's nice and soft, so they can dig through all that leaf litter quite easily. And I'm sure from, uh, well, all the workers that were here and, and well... Um, doing their thing. They've obviously turned up a few grubs and beetles that were maybe trying to hide away. So they're very happy. Hello, you're now hopping even closer. Just watching us every now and then. So you'll see basically what we've got going on over here. This is our general car park. This is a fence that really just tries to keep the elephants and lions and things out. So we can close the gate there. Um, we have an electric wire on, on the way around, but it doesn't stop the leopards. They come walking right past here all the time. The dwarf mongoose like to play out here too. Uh, it's quite fun. See, he's quite happy to just hop as close as it really wants to. And if you were to just stand here, it would probably just come right at your feet. Hello. What you doing? Enjoying an afternoon snack? I'd love to know what they were thinking. We might get the yellow-billed hornbill flying back in again. David, you know what I've just realized? I think we've just stumbled across the greatest sandpaper raisin ever to be in the Sabi sand. I'm not even joking. Excuse me, birds coming through. Oh my goodness. I'm not even joking. Mmm. Look. That wasn't a nice one. I'm being unladylike. Let's see. No, why are they so terrible? Have you tried them? I'm really disappointed now because every time we see sandpaper raisins out in the bush, we're very excited because of the delicious fruit. Remember, I was, I was trying to describe the taste to you a couple of days ago. And um, normally they're very juicy. These ones, however, are quite dry. They're not very nice at all, and I'm so disappointed. Maybe they're, we're, we're a bit late here. No, that's also not nice. Oh, literally I've never been so excited in my life for a fruit. But um, we didn't win this time round. Oh, they're not very nice at all, which would maybe explain why the birds and things are not eating them. There's not really, there's not really any flesh at all on these seeds. Look at that. Completely dry. Oh, I don't want to eat that. That's no good. Now, someone else that's in the area driving about, about looking for a leopard is Steve. Good afternoon everybody, welcome. My name is Steve Falkenbridge, joined on camera by Mr. Craig Zabbitt, and we are out indeed in the wilderness. Um, we heard monkeys alarm calling about an hour and a half ago, just here close to us, sort of northwest of northeast of camp, around the small little Gallego pan. Just had a little scratch around in the area, but there's no tracks. Uh, apparently Hukumuri, the, the visiting male leopard, or the the potentially new male leopard of the area was left somewhere sort of north of here this morning and uh, monkeys do not lie when they alarm call monkeys don't lie so it's possible that they saw him and he's in the drainage line over there so we're just gonna keep it along a little bit see if anything comes out on the road then we will go back and investigate a little closer sure what the others have told you please feel free to send through your questions hashtag safari live let us know what you would like to see and discuss this afternoon after all this is an interactive live safari and we wouldn't do it if it wasn't for the viewers out there so let us know what you'd like to see and hopefully we can cater for it it's a beautiful day 26 degrees celsius 80 82 I think Fahrenheit so a very nice and relatively cool afternoon it was overcast this morning with the potential for rain but we never got wet never got wet it rained in certain places it's raining outside the reserve but thankfully we didn't get wet it is a little bit strange to have rain this time of year but the vegetation definitely enjoys it 
Linda, you would like to see Tandian Cub. Well, that would be sensational to see them. We are not in the area at the moment. Uh, maybe Ralph will go over to that area. I'm going to spend a little bit of time over here and failing that, yes, I'll most definitely go towards the east and see if we can pick up on any, any more tracks. I know Taylor had some tracks this morning. I'm not 100% sure where they were. We did walk into that area this morning and then with looming rain, we decided to slowly start moving back. So um, we never, on the bushwalk, never found any of those tracks. I'm not 100% sure where, but I have an idea. I have an idea. Hello, Ashley. You would like to see lions. You'd want to know what the chance is. Well, there's always a chance, Ashley. You know, we are an open reserve. There are no fences between us and all the reserves around in the Kruger Park. And these animals, they just come and go. You know, we can wake up in the morning and there can be lions there. Generally speaking, uh, the cats move in at night or early morning when it's a little bit cooler. But um, only two, three weeks ago, I came out of drive just like this, heard monkeys alarm calling, went down to the dam water hole just off to our western side now, or southern side now, and in strolled two of the Birmingham big male lions. So these things can happen. There's nothing preventing uh, cats from just walking in and doing their thing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. It's not common to see cats moving in the day, but bearing in mind two days ago, uh, I think James was following up on the Sticks Pride who were just over here and then they moved about this time. So it happens, you know, it happens if they're thirsty or if they're moving in response to whatever they could be moving in response to, then that is what happens. So this is live. We cannot predict what will happen next. So there's every possibility of seeing lions. I wouldn't mind showing you a lion or two. Okay, well, I think Taylor has got something up her sleeve, something unpredictable. I'm always quite unpredictable, right? You're in the courtyard now. Catch Darby. <laughs> that wasn't a very good throw. This is our bonfire pit. So this is where we normally stand around and we hold hands and we sing songs with one another. It's really quite nice. Like you all know, camp is really just one big happy family. We don't do any fire walking or anything like that, so don't worry. Also, the fire is out. But now this is the prized possession of the Wild Earth Juma Camp. It's the disco ball. Um, how do we make it spin? I suppose you might as well... This is also the water buck that lives in camp. I don't have a stick, so I'm going to have to use it to spin it. There we go. Normally it spins a little bit better. I had to climb all the way up top there. You may also notice that there's a torch that is attached to a, head, a headlamp that is attached to the tree. That goes on, and then at night you can imagine. It's just so beautiful and sparkly. Lily, you like the paintings on the wall? I think it feels like we're in Mozambique, sort of, when, we, uh, when we're around here. <laughs> That's because we have sand as well. It's quite nice. So you can see why we have so many animals in camp. The hornbills come down and do what they were doing outside. The dwarf mongoose often playing around here. And then the starlings, like I said, they normally take a perch up. One of the other, the other oh yes, sit on the lower branches. Come with me. Kosi says, I'm going to show you where Gregory lives. Are you ready for this? We've got to be careful because there's also a mamba that lives here. The sandbank. You remember the sandbags from the deluge? Yes, you all remember that very well. Here they are still doing well. This is where Gregory lives. Now, I wish I had a bright enough headlamp because mine is not working so well. But Gregory goes inside there. It looks like somebody's been walking here. Actually, I think Gregory's come out today. I can see a track on either side. Very gracefully coming through here. It was a nice warm day, so it wouldn't surprise me if she was out and about, just catching up on some feeding. I don't think she likes us anymore because she doesn't come to visit very often. And then little Gregory, who is uh, Robert Jr., went down inside there too. And then, like I said, there's a snake and squirrels and all sorts of things that live around here. So, yes. Close this to keep the bush back out. Now, apparently, somebody else is also lingering around camp, and it wasn't me. Well, 
we're getting closer to uh, Twin Dams. I've just popped past Treehouse Dam, very quiet there, and now heading down towards uh, Twin Dams. And I, then I think because it's this time of the day, it's still quite warm, it's, it's like I said a little bit earlier, there is a little bit of gustery breeze coming through every now and then. But, um, you know, through all of my experience at this time of day regularly you get elephants coming down to drink you can also have the predators coming down to have that midday drink but it's not generally their real active part of the day the predators I mean elephants can be a perfect time and uh, in different national parks around southern Africa it's always been one of my go-to kinds of things to say to my guests when we arrive at a at a camp or um, you know a place in the early morning or towards midday I would always say go down to the waterhole and wait I'm pretty sure you're gonna have some elephants come down and drink and they always used to think I was the elephant whisperer because uh, you know it's just looking at different animals um, activity uh, during different seasons and uh, different times of the day as well and elephants generally uh, do like to go down to water holes in the midday to go and get their nice big thirst quencher and before heading out into the afternoon and going feeding once again normally quite active in the morning and then that midday all going down to the water and then sort of calming off in the early part of the afternoon um, before they start to feed again going right through into the night as it cools off again so generally very good time to head down to the water uh, at these times of day all through the year with elephants um, and obviously with the predators now as we're going into winter and we do have you know cooler afternoons you can have more activity from them during the day obviously they do have their most part during the night um, but uh, very good chance of spotting predators just coming down for a drink or being active as well uh, more so in winter in summer uh, mostly uh, they do rest up during the heat of the day especially if it's hot and humid that combination is is quite a killer not only for for humans um, you know I often think if I feel really sluggish a lot of the animals with especially higher metabolism generally will feel the same if not worse now just coming down here towards Twin Dams it doesn't seem like there is much happening here so my next feeling is if I was an animal like I always say if you want to catch fish you need to think like a fish so if I was an animal out here in this kind of uh, a day, I think I'd be like to hang in the little wati or a drainage line or nice big trees where there's a bit of fruit around. The jackalberries are in fruit at the moment. Also the brown ivories, the guaris. And so it's normally a good spot to go into. And as I say, there's twin dams. Very quiet there for the moment. But we just got to put ourselves in the right spots and keep on doing that we're going to get something exciting jumping out at us a little bit of patience and perseverance and i'm sure we're going to have a very good afternoon so nothing happening there for now now don't forget to send us any of your questions and your comments and um, if you want me to focus on any topics in particular, if you've got any kinds of thoughts that you want to share with us uh, on this wonderful day out on safari, then please just send it through and I will do my best to focus on those subjects or chat about them and see how we can just get the debate going. See also the russet bush willow fruits are fruiting out now at, mo at, at the moment and so our, con our search is going to continue out along here I've got a very good feeling there's something around the next corner just quickly getting in a quick workout okay right done always good to do a little bit of fitness for the day I believe there were some requests for the gym well everybody welcome to the Butts and Betty's gym it's lovely it's a makeshift gym, but we can, well, it works. So here we have our mats, which we will roll out, do a couple of, do a couple of sit-ups. Two, three, right, done. <laughs> I'm laughing because I can.
can hear them laughing at me inside. And then, what are we going to do now? Bicep curls. Jerry can. I don't know. I'm just going to put these down now. <laughs> I don't know. Aren't those door stops? I don't really know what to do with them. <laughs> it's all falling apart. Yes, Andrea, Mamba does live in camp, but don't worry about that. Um, actually, these rings over here are for the, the gentlemen. Normally, they're a lot higher. They go quite up. I'm sure you've all seen the gymnasts doing it. I'm not going to do it for you. If you ask nicely, Conrad will come out and show you. He says no. Okay. Well, Conrad's there inside. <laughs> Hiding. Right. He doesn't want to come out and show us. But now there's something very important that I want to show you. Oh, chat. It's one last thing. And then we're going out into the wilderness. Is look at our plants. This is Tina. You can see she has her name on it. On her little pot. Who's this? <laughs> did Rebecca have something to do with the naming of the plants? If she did, then I, then I completely understand. They live outside final controls at the moment, killing them. So the presenters come out every now and then. And uh, we have a well, we have a look. Actually, no, anybody with a green thumb comes out here, has a look, waters the plants down. Normally, we have to do this because they've overwatered. No, we'll do that. Anyways, we're going to go and see if we can find some elephants out on the open plains. Maybe a giraffe, if we're lucky. Someone that will have better luck finding animals is Ralph. As Pumba and the family of little piglets start to disappear off onto the bank of the Mulwati and my feeling was quite correct. I'm going to find quite a lot of animals down here in the Mulwati, I believe. Nice little drainage line, lots of cool areas, lots to feed on as well for herbivores. And then that for me is, is um, also going to lead predators down here as well. And look at these little piglets. We are now almost on eye level with them. And how many was that, Senza? I think it was four piglets, eh? One, two, three, four. Yeah, they've disappeared around the corner a little bit, but nice little family of them. And it seems like Hukumuri, the male leopard. Oh, and here comes a nice male Nyala, a bull, just crossing the dry riverbed. He's a good looking chap. They are one of the most elegant of all the antelope, I would say. You see how he's got those lovely white tips to his horns as well. That's showing that he is into his prime. He is a fully grown, matured adult bull in Yala. And he's just enjoying his time a little bit with these warthogs. Oh, a little bit nervous of them. Sometimes they just trigger each other. If the pigs run off. And then so do the antelope also get a little bit skittish. But that's why I've come down here, because I do feel that this is the place to be when it's nice and warm. So I'm going to continue on our little, slow little ramble along the Mlawati here. Because uh, I've also heard some of the little pearl-spotted owlets calling. And it's been wonderful. And so the search, I think Hukumuri was around this morning. I think it was Taylor that found him. Steve is also looking for him. And I wonder how that's going. Did you hear that pearl spotted owlet calling? I heard it. The search so far for Hukumuri is um, has not drawn any conclusions um, nothing on the road kind of found the area where the vehicles that were with him they're turning around and all that sort of thing but I think he's right in there by the pan in the depression close to the lodge and I know that there's some guests have just checked in so going to give them a half an hour or an hour or so to sort of vacate their rooms before I end up getting accused of peeking so I'm sure 
He's probably right in there, in the depression, right next to one of the rooms. And I don't want someone to think that um, there's this guy with binoculars stalking around outside my room. <laughs> that wouldn't go down very well, especially if you're a paying guest. So we'll just give them a little while to, to come out of camp. I saw the vehicles arriving just shortly after, well, while we were leaving to go on drive. So I think there's some new guests checking in. And um, I'll just wait for, for one of the guides to come on the radio and then I'll know. Good, we can go and have a look. Um, but I am sure Hukumuri would enjoy those warthogs that um, Ralph has showed you. He does enjoy, as you have seen on countless occasions, he enjoys himself a little bit of pig. And um, I wonder if they are related to the one from the other day. If there were four of them, it's possible. Two adults, two youngsters. Shame. They get over it pretty quickly though. You know, in the moment it's pretty pretty traumatic but they seem to sort of just carry on with life the next day hello Bobby um, on TV show in February Noel had Hukumuri kill a warthog and very shortly afterwards he killed the Steenbok um, he's stolen a bushbuck from from Tingana so he didn't kill that but I haven't personally seen him with any other type of meat have you Craig have you seen Ukumuri? I'm surely he surely he's had an impala or two, but we just don't see it. You know, he does also spend a lot of time in the West. We don't know what he does that side. But I have no doubt he is a very efficient impala hunter as well. Talking about hunters and catching fish, Ralph has got someone who's an expert. And this is a little brown hooded kingfisher one of the resident kingfisher that stay here some of the other ones that uh, do stay here the giant kingfisher as well as the pied and so he's always around but these are predominantly insectivorous kingfishers um, as opposed to the pied and the giant who are pretty much piscivores eating mostly if not only fish you know, I, and I'm not going to say that anybody's experience is wrong, but my, in my experience with brown hooded kingfishers, um, I've seen them catching insects next to the water, and I've also seen them bombing into the water, but not head first. They actually, if you watch them very closely, they bomb their body into the water, and not in a fishing mode, merely as a bath. So they just splash themselves, and then they fly up onto the branch, and they splash themselves again, and they fly up onto the branch, mostly down to feather maintenance, and uh, helping to get rid of some of the dust and the oil, from the preen gland um, but I have heard other guides saying that they have witnessed them fishing uh, but through my experience when I've looked at them very closely I believe that what they're doing when they're splashing in the water is literally just that having a nice little splash and this brown hooded kingfisher I've found here on numerous occasions and I think he's probably got a nest uh, if not just roosting up in one of these trees here and he's always here so it's lovely to come and see him quite regularly but it's always difficult with birds to watch them uh, Monique in London you say that you love kingfishers I do too they're normally very brightly colored and well the brown hooded kingfisher isn't as uh, elaborate coloration as for instance the woodland kingfisher or the little tiny pygmy or malachite kingfishers which are really beautiful blues and reds but um, well this is one of the residents and he just keeps himself a little bit more of a low profile I would say um, and does have a lot of competition when all the migratory kingfishers return now in Britain I think in London well uh, maybe in the canals and so on I think and you can correct me if I'm wrong which um, kingfishers do you get there I think you get the malachite and I think you might even get the pied but you can you can correct me I don't think you get the giant kingfisher um, and there might be one or two others but I'm, I'm pretty sure that you do get the malachite kingfisher in Europe um, along those little canals and so on catching all those little fish but I'm pretty sure they would migrate 
Don't they? I don't know too much about it. So please share with us. Let me know. Send us your comments about the kingfishers in the different parts of the world because uh, it's always interesting to learn about different birds from wherever you are. And so we'd love to know. And if you've got some photos, well, send them in to the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. We'd love to see any of those because it's normally quite difficult as well to get especially them in uh, flight or catching any fish bombing into the water. It would be lovely to see your photos and uh, showcase your skills. Right, Mr. Insectivorous Kingfisher, let's head on. We'll leave you to it. He did just actually catch, it seemed like a moth or something that was flying on the ground there. We just missed it, but uh, he's going to sit on that branch and stay there while we carry on down the Mlulwati and uh, carry on our search for all sorts, everything and alles. And I think we're not the only one that's doing exactly that. <laughs> yes, we are on probably the worst section of road around and you've come just in time to experience it with us. It's just a small little piece, nice and bumpy. Hold on to your hats. We go almost through. We're right up on the eastern side. Before the boundaries just up on the other side here. We've done a big loop around. Hold on, Craigo. There we go, through it. Some of the roads surely, for example, this one would be a very, very old management road. And uh, so wouldn't have been designed with the in interest of being driven very regularly or for game drives. So um, lots of elephant activity. He loves to find some elephants. There's been loads of tracks in and out coming up and down. There is a dam on the other side of, of the road here, Tamburti Dam. It's just north of us. No doubt that is where they're going to be drinking. As we head back in towards Juma itself, towards Vuyatela watering hole and close to Galago. Still looking for some tracks. We switch off every now and again to see if we can hear any alarm calls. But clearly, um, if it was Hukumuri, he's probably stopped moving. And when a leopard stops moving, he's not spotted by anything, and they get away with um, being quite easily concealed. Shamama, leopards can go through a fence. No fence can stop a leopard, to be honest. Uh, national parks, game reserves that have got fences, the fences do not stop the leopards. They do go through them. They can dig or go under or sometimes even go over. They're very, very versatile cats. So there's nothing really keeping them out of camp apart from their fear of man. And uh, Jerry walking back from her little house just the other night got, we think, Shadulu female right there by the vehicles. So, and they've had, I think it was Rebecca and Kirst had Hosanna right next to their room as well. And we have a hyena that comes into camp every single night. So yeah, leopards do come and go, but um, they don't see us as prey, and so they're not really looking for us, but they move through. You know, they do know that there's Nyala and Deka that like to sort of secret themselves in and around the camp, because we've got a quite nicely wooded vegetation area or, or river dr drainage depression nearby. So there would be some small antelope hiding in the thickets there and we find cats moving through there quite regularly. Well, whether we see it or not, we often find the tracks of where they've been moving and we believe Hukumuri is in a very similar sort of place. Okay, well, we're gonna continue on here, see if we can find anything of interest. And while we do, Taylor's got something that is mightily interesting. It is quite interesting because we found some termites and they're rather large termites. You can see that one that's moving around now. I think it must be a soldier. It is almost double the size of the, of the other termites who I suspect are probably workers. You can see a couple of them. Now, David, there's actually, there's a whole lot of them. I wonder if you can see them through here. I wish I'd actually brought my torch out. I was silly that I didn't. There's, normally with termites, they build their, well, they start their colonies underground. 
course, some of the species will utilize and feed on wood, and that's exactly what's going on over here. They, I wonder, I'm not sure what species we've got. To, I think we're standing on a, a developing termite mound. Most of it, I think, is underneath the ground. And it seems like an elephant or someone has been rubbing up against this tree and stripped the bark off of it because there's all sorts of, sorts of damage here. There's a couple of fresh pieces that have been pulled off too. Maybe even a wildebeest or a zebra could have come up and had a scratch on this too. And it's fairly loose. It's very, very loose. I mean, I just touched that and you saw how it all shook. So I don't think that they're living up in here. I think that they might just be trying to um, well, feed on the wood. That's really, really cool. Look how big that is. Now, you wouldn't want one of those to bite your finger because those massive mandibles will pack a serious punch and that's their sort of first defense there is that if they feel like they are threatened or if something comes around like an aardvark and starts digging down into the earth they're going to latch on at every sort of angle from the ears to the tip of the snout and uh, hopefully that'll be painful enough for the aardvark to move away or whatever it may be that's feeding on them i've had one of them bite me before it was horrible it drew blood on my hand and your hands are fairly tough too and they go back inside. So I wonder if those soldiers aren't around. They don't actually seem bothered with us. At one point I thought they were all going to run away, but there's a whole lot of them. I mean, here's some more. They're all working here. But every time the wind blows, a lot of the soil that has been taken up here all starts to drop down too. So I don't know how long they've been in here for. It seems quite hard. I'm just feeling sort of the, the soil. That's... That's quite cool though, but a very interesting structure. Now I don't think that this is just home to uh, termites. I think that there are lizards and things and possibly some scorpions living here too. I'm sure snakes. We've actually just been trying to find some of those critters. So we'll start looking. I still want to stick my face anywhere where something's going to jump out and try and get me, but there's so many little crevices in here. Even for a squirrel as an emergency could probably hide underneath a piece of bark like this, but uh, I'm trying to think. I don't think I've ever seen a snake in here. I don't think we've ever found a scorpion on here before. There are a couple of trees that we can check where we've seen scorpions before that seem to be hot spots. And we'll try and have a look for some of them today too. Very cool. It's really, 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 really pretty in here. I'd love to be that small that I could crawl around on the inside of the bark and into all sorts of little crevices. That's really wonderful. They don't seem to be too active though, moving around a little bit, but I mean, I can't see if they're feeding, they're not collecting anything. Some are walking, others are just sitting in the sun. The soldiers are just marching about. Those two in there are very busy. Quite interesting. I'm oh, sorry, Darby. Um, Ali, it, it takes them a very, very long time to start building a mound, but sometimes what happens if the queen dies of one colony, and uh, eventually the entire colony will disappear with her. Um, a new colony, uh, or well, a new alate can move on in. So after we've had a lot of rain, then we'll see the princes and princesses. So the winged termites will fly off. Once they find a mate, they lose their wings and they go down into the earth. And they can continue an old termite mount. But <clears throat> some of these bigger ones that we see are probably in excess of 50 years old, maybe even a little bit more than that. So. So it all depends on how long the queen will survive for. That's beautiful. Right, now someone is taking it easy this afternoon. It's Ralph and he's on a sunset cruise. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just uh, just making my way along the Mlawati and uh, it's, it's wonderful in this drainage line and I also like coming through here because it often reminds me of uh, driving in Namibia in those ephemeral rivers and this is a seasonal river, it's not flowing underground but uh, those ephemeral rivers that we get in Namibia are very similar to this kind of seen here. There's another little kingfisher on the branch there. We can have a quick look at him. Let's see if it's the same as the one before. We're having a kingfisher afternoon. Ah, old bird. You're saying that you don't get the malachite or the pied kingfisher. Only the common kingfisher in Western Europe. 
That's interesting because I thought that th there was a malachite, but uh, I stand corrected. So, well done. Thank you uh, for that. The common kingfisher. Does it have elaborate colors? Because I was always under the impression that the malachite, uh, uh, or maybe that common kingfisher is a, a malachite-looking um, kingfisher as well. Now, this one is about... 500 meters away from the last one that we saw. Ah, Aaron, you're saying that you get the sacred kingfisher in New Zealand. And that sounds very interesting. Do you know why it is sacred, Aaron? Uh, because we've got the sacred ibis here in South Africa and uh, pretty much right across Africa, uh, wherever there's uh, quite a lot of uh, water around because they are also predominantly, you know, around wetland areas, um, marshy areas. And the reason reason they're called sacred ibis, now a little bit off topic with the kingfishers, but um, you're talking about your sacred kingfisher. The sacred ibis uh, is called as such because in Egypt um, they, they, had, they were uh, uh, making plantations of all sorts, and I think it was mainly around rice, where they, had, um, uh, uh, they failed uh, in a couple of seasons with their crops, and they thought it was because the sacred ibis, who moved around in those sort of wetland areas where they planted their crops, were eating all the seeds. And... Um, as a result, they started to kill all the sacred ibis. They obviously weren't called that at the time. Um, and they killed all of them. But what they found out after that was there was a very big increase in Bilharzia. And that's where they actually realized that the sacred ibis was feeding on freshwater snails, which is the host um, animal of the, uh, the virus that, that um, uh, gives you Bilharzia. So once they worked that out. It was one of the pharaohs or whoever was in charge. He said to them, right, from now on we will be protecting this bird because it's helping us uh, with the sickness of Bilharzia. I don't think that they probably called it that at that time, but that sickness anyway, um, a waterborne disease with the host being a freshwater snail, we leave this bird now because he's helping us with this disease and from now on he will be known as the sacred ibis and so that nobody would then touch that bird after that. So that's the reason for the sacred ibis, but what's the reason for the sacred kingfisher? That's the question, Aaron. So send it through if you know. If you don't, if anybody else does, well, let us know. And that little kingfisher, he's obviously bobbing his head up and down and left to right. Do you know why they do that? There's a question for you while I continue on my drive. Why do birds, a lot of hunting birds, as well as lizards, why do they bob their heads up and down and left to right? And Senzo's now doing the jiggy jiggy in the back there while I'm saying that. But uh, a lot of birds and reptiles do that. What is the reason for it? I will give you the answer a little bit later. We'll try to find some more birds that are exhibiting that behavior. And um, it's a very interesting reason why they do that. But um, some other animals that live up in the trees don't bob their heads. And um, it seems that Taylor's found one of them. Look at this little critter. Not up in a tree for a change. We're having luck with squirrels on termite mounds today. This one apparently was seen by David and James not so long ago, just the other day. And... David said something interesting to me. He said he think they think it lives in this termite mound. It honestly would not surprise me as to where a squirrel would find a home. I think an unoccupied termite mound would be a great spot to sort of sleep in. Although they do prefer trees. But maybe it just spends its day around here. Perhaps this is its day sleeping area. But if I was a, a little mammal like that too or anything, I think I'd also be sitting on that little mound enjoying the last of the afternoon sun. There's a bit of the wind picking up, so <clears throat> maybe we're in for a chilly night. So best you warm up. I'm surprised we haven't seen more squirrels today. Let's take a little, shall we just pretend like we're not walking towards a squirrel? Then we will. Oh, it's gone. We'll see. We're going to go towards this tree. We're going to see if we can get a little bit closer. Maybe it comes back out because there's another hole up in this 
in this tree over here, and it's, it looks like a false marula. And so, Bobby, what importance, what ecological importance do squirrels have? Well, I suppose squirrels are firstly a prey species, so a lot of animals rely on them. So from eagles to, well, snakes and things like that, they all feast upon squirrels. Squirrels also, I would imagine, have something something to do with um, the dispersal of seeds or how far marula nuts end up traveling, not even anywhere near where, where they were found. They'll take them to all sorts of places. So I think they help with dispersing seeds because they don't eat all the nuts in the end. Um, what else could a, a squirrel do? Let me think. I don't know, I'm sure there's a whole lot of different things out here, but they're very important. Everything out here is exceptionally important. I just want to check this tree to see if this is actually a hole in the tree or if it's just uh, if it's just deceiving. No, I think it is. So I wonder if the squirrel actually isn't living up in here as well or has a second sort of house. It's a really big... I'm wondering... Oh, you see, just up there, it's all hollowed out. Looks like there are some termites that have been that have been having a go at this tree too. It's not very nice, but definitely a nice spot for the uh, for the squirrel to live in. Looks like there's some ants crawling around. Anyways, it's got safety here too. If it needs to climb, go from the ground and go all the way up to the top, we've got some. We, yes, there is a can there. I'm not sure what that was. If there, I don't know why the can is nailed to the tree. For the elephants. What does that do to the elephants? I think they were trying to do some research project on elephants. I'm not really sure. Anyways, perhaps that was their favorite, favorite cool drink. Who knows? They were trying to find out what cool drink elephants prefer, what soda elephants prefer. So I have actually seen a couple of other things around, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> ah, it looks like it's been mowed here, don't you think? Looks like somebody has actually come with a big lawn mower, but it hasn't. No one has been here. Rexon most certainly hasn't come around here. That's all just natural. So this is how quickly the animals can graze down the grass. Anyways, let's go to Rolf before his bird flies away. Well, I know that we've seen a couple of kingfishers now, but this one is just sitting so perfectly for us in the light that I've just changed to the opposite end, and now we've got him head first, and so I thought it, it would be nice just to stop and watch him because he's quite comfortable there on that branch and looking like he's looking for little insects as well. And so don't forget the question about the bobbing head. If there are any answers, send them through. Bridget, that's an interesting one. Um, bobbing the head helps to move the, head, the, the food down the crop. I'm sure that it would, but I'm talking more about when they actually spot something. And then they bob their head up and down and, sometimes, and also from side to side a little bit. So... Right. Mr. Tubok, um, you are absolutely correct. Uh, they do bob their head up and down and side to side to uh, increase the depth um, perception of the target that they are looking at. Because of the type of uh, vision that they have, it's all about cones um, and uh, I forget the other one that's inside the eye as well. But uh, you've got a number of cones and it's ossicles, or, uh, I forget the other part. But it depends on how many numbers of those that you have. Now, birds generally have a very very good uh, far distance and extreme distance but then they can't tell very well the depth so they bob their head up and down and, and, and a little bit from side to side almost triangulating uh, the target so that's why they do it and lizards do it as well obviously birds have evolved from lizards and basically uh, flying reptiles so 
That's why they both do it. Very good long distance vision, but not a very good judge of depth. And that's why they do it. You will see birds of prey doing it, and you'll also see kingfishers doing it when they're sitting on a branch. And once they see a target, they start bobbing up and down and a little bit uh, right to left as well. Just working out exactly how far away from them it is because they need to plan their attack. Now this one obviously seeming quite relaxed. The one previous was a little bit more actively hunting and was bobbing his head up and down and obviously working out the little targets. Now if you listen up there's a little pearl spotted owlet calling. in New Zealand, you say that the sacred kingfisher was called as such because the Polynesians thought that it controlled the waves. That's very, very interesting indeed. So the sacred kingfisher of New Zealand was thought to control the waves. Um, well, that is very impressive and I'm sure because it was around the water so regularly that, uh, and probably so good in the water as well. If you'll start now for me, Rusty. Alright, so we're going to continue on now, look for any other birds here in the thickets and any animals that might pop out as well. But it seems Steve has found you an animal that likes staying in the thickets too. We have found some animals, finally. We have done loop after loop after loop and I got back into the area of Gallagher Pan. I was going to get off and go have a look and Unfortunately, I encountered some guests sitting on the deck, so I decided it was best for us to just leave. So we'll maybe go back there after dark and hopefully get the movement of Hukumuri. But at the moment, we've got a big male kudu. We had Vuyatela water hole now. Big male kudu over there with some impala behind. It's good to see the depth or the size difference between them. There's still a little bit of rutting behavior going on with some of the male in parlors, but isn't that a magnificent specimen of the kudu? He's got lots and lots of ox peckers on him. Well spotted owlet calling in the background, if you can hear it. And in the dried up dam itself, we have got a herd of zebra feeding on the short some of it short grass growing in the mud and some of it quite long and juicy grass. Here they are Betty, the zebras are out here. They're feeding on nice sort of luscious grass that's growing out of the pan itself. You can see it's quite green. All sorts of beautiful things in there. It's hard for me to really tell what species. You can hear the owl in the background. There's even some kudu down here as well in the, the dried up dam feeding on the small forbs that would be growing in and amongst the grasses that you find down here. There we go, you can see she's ripped up a little creeper of sorts. As I was saying this morning, kudu are not grazers at all so if you see them with their head to the ground they are feeding on small forbs or flowers they're not feeding on, on a grass, feeding on dicotyledons, so two leafed plants when they come out of the seed, they've got two leaves. Those grasses are monocotyledons, only one. Looking quite healthy in fact. You can see her, her rump is very, very good. Julie, you are in luck. Craig is going to pan to the right and uh, we'll see the little zebra foal just there, top, sort of top rightish of the screen. Craig's going to go into it now. There it is. Not feeding like the other zebra. Or is it? Oh, there we go. But probably still reliant a lot on milk from mum. There we go. A little bit excited. Oi, jumping up and down. So reliant on milk from mum, so not feeding too much at this time. Wants to play now. Come on, Mum, put your head up. Zebra foals can be the cutest little things. A few months ago, 
You saw a couple of them behaving very interestingly with us, jumping up and down, galloping around. When you're drinking mum's milk, you don't need to feed on on the grass, and it's a, it's a never-ending battle for zebra to keep themselves nourished, constantly feeding, constantly feeding with their heads down. Not like the kudu that can feed out here in the open and then go and sit in a shady area to ruminate. The zebra, I discussed the dung of the rhino and hippo this morning, constantly feeding. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. Hmm, baby zebra is very cute. So even though this water hole is dried up, there's still benefit for the animals. Those forbs and grasses that are growing have attracted them, which means that it's a very it's an, another attraction for for some of the predators, even though it's a dry water hole. You could still get something coming through to to take one of these zebras down or one of the kudu but they're out in the open feeling quite relaxed there's a whole lot of them they're all over the place there's impala there's nyala around the corner as well so strength in numbers someone is paying attention so you can feed with your head down in safety They are the one-year-old male in parlors. And we are going to stay here with these animals for a little while longer and see if anything happens. And let's go and see if Taylor's got anything more interesting to tell you about the camp. We do, just sitting right at the top of this buffalo thorn that has been beautifully manicured by, I think, the elephants and probably the impala and kudu that hang around here. And all the way on top of that tree, those birds that are flying, those are all, besides the bright blue one, of course, are a southern grey-headed sparrows and a Cape Glossy starling that's joining them. Now, I suspect that they've decided to sit all the way up on top of those thorny branches, just like that squirrel was doing earlier, just to catch the last of the afternoon rays. I'm sure that's going to warm them up quite nicely. And sunbathing is very important for birds. They do spend a lot of time doing it, always in the morning, just as the sun has rid risen, although you see monkeys doing it too. Lots of the different creatures will. And then, of course, in the afternoons. It doesn't look like they're doing much foraging at the moment. And they're very gregarious, so you'll often see them in big flocks on the ground looking for seeds. Sometimes they eat a bit of fruit when it's available and I'm sure that they nibble on the odd insect when there's a chance to, but predominantly feeding on all the grass seeds. So you'll find them in these open areas. And, and it's not uncommon to see them with lots of other birds too. Very nice. Now, Clifford, you've asked how do animals react to potential natural or the, or the natural disasters, so maybe like a big fire or a flood? Well, luckily for, for birds, they're going to have to abandon their nests if they do have any, and they will. There's absolutely nothing that they can do. That's another starling. That's the virtual starling. They're all just flying down into the distance um, and they're going to do just what that's starting to they're going to have to fly away so birds are really lucky they can escape things floods and not all of them i think do you want a, you want a hand there darby right. are you sure okay well i tried you saw i was trying to be a gentle lady anyways <laughs> Um, basically, they'll just they'll just off and go. Like I said, if you're if you're a chicken, you can't fly it. You're gonna um, and probably not make it. But for natural disasters, I don't think it's the birds are the ones that are worrying about. It. It's often the reptiles, and sometimes mammals get trapped too. Um, so yes, those uh, it's a huge problem for them. I always feel sorry for tortoises and and lizards and things like that. They can't escape fires quick enough. That aren't as fast moving. Anyways, I think I can actually hear Steve's voice just down in the distance. I wasn't even speaking. She must have telepathy. <laughs> We're still here. We've just moved a bit further forward. Not sure if you can hear the ox peckers there having a feast on the back of the zebra. The male in parlor calling in the background. That very strange gurgling sound. And you see the youngsters decided it's had enough. It would like to lie down. And that often happens. They get quite tired. 
you know, they're not the ones feeding, so they've had their milk nourishment for the day and they get a bit tired and they want to lie down and it's perfectly normal. You often get mum standing over it, watching out. And quite often in a zebra herd, individuals at a time will lie down while others stand and watch. They have to sleep. They have to physically, like us, put their heads down and nod off for a while so as to maintain their brain processes. Minamu, when zebras are born, the mother generally goes away a little bit from the herd and then apparently um, the mother and the youngster imprint their patterns on each other. So they recognize each other's pattern and then also the smell. So whether it's just the pattern or just the smell or both, I mean obviously we can't know for sure, but at, at least one of those seems to work quite well because even when they return back to the herd, the youngster can quite easily identify mum and vice versa. So very important for that early stage for them to spend that time together. And then mum is never too far away from the youngster. And there's a little bit of playing happening. They are very tactile animals, Zebra. They love touching. They love playing. If any of you have ever played with a horse or know much about horses, you know how much horses like to touch and feel each other. And uh, zebra herds, for example, you, you get the stallion, and then the stallion starts off when he's quite young with one female, and then he might they might have a foal together, and then as he starts getting more mature, he gets a second, a third, and a fourth. But you generally see, you know, a, a stallion getting between maybe four and ten females in a herd. Uh, obviously, it depends on on their age, their status. Um, sometimes a, a male gets killed and then his females are all up for grabs and then a local male can sometimes just adopt them all himself. So he can almost double his numbers in just a day, for example, if a male disappears. Because the females need a male. He, um, he helps in protecting them. He helps in fighting off unwanted attention from other males. And they spend a life bond together. That's what death do us part, you could say. And he releases his youngsters, his females, his juvenile, his daughters, from time to time to other males that are searching. Obviously, he needs to challenge them a little bit, but it's not a very aggressive challenge, almost like a father sizing up the prospective husband for their daughter in human society. I suppose sometimes it can be more aggressive than others. It really depends. Ashley zebra are a bulk grazer, so they can feed on quite sort of bulky, sort of uh, nutrient poor grasses. But at this time of year, they will be selecting as juicy a grass as they can. Um, zebra are able to crop the grass, so they've got the teeth on the top and the bottom of the jaw, of the front of the jaw. So they're able to quite easily uh, mow the grass down. So they will select the juiciest and the best grass as they possibly can this time of year, in line with all the other grazers. Um, and they, but they're able to chop quite tall grass, uh, where wildebeest feed on grass that zebra have chopped down. So the wildebeest generally are facilitated by the feeding of the zebra. So they'll feed on very similar grasses, but zebra are able to feed on longer grass. Up in the Mara you see it, very tall grass, the zebra crop it right down, and that new growth gets sort of fed upon by, by the wildebeest. But all animals will feed on as best nutrient-rich vegetation as they can, but it's all got to do with the size of the mouth. The zebra's mouth is equivalently the same size as a wildebeest and maybe even a waterbuck. So the waterbuck and the zebra are quite bulky feeders. Uh, the wildebeest selectively bulky, uh, but you get something like a rhino or a hippo that's got an enormous mouth and very difficult for them to select what they feed. So they just, just gulp it all down whereas a zebra will be as selective as they possibly can with the tools being their mouth, as they can be. But they are benefited having teeth in the top of their mouth, so they are able to chop it right down. Hmm, take care, that's an interesting question. Very interesting question, I have no idea. Take care wanted to know why the body stripes are vertical and, oh, hang on vertical yeah and the leg stripes horizontal I think it's just the way that they've been painted you know it's just the stroke goes from left to right I have no idea I think it's just the way that they the way that it works it, uh, it kind of acts as a blur together so the legs 
not necessarily as sort of optical illusion-y as the body is, but when zebras move together, that up and down pattern of the body facilitates a very nice flow and confusion tactic, which works very, very well when they're in large numbers. When they're on their own, standing in the open, it doesn't work very, very well. But why the leg stripes are like that, I have absolutely no idea. There's a youngster still trying to get some milk. Gary, yes, they will try. They will try to fend their foals against predators, especially the stallion. The stallion will, will try and protect the entire herd against predators, sometimes at their detriment. Um, and often when you can actually tell who the stallion is, if you approach a breeding herd or a family harem of, like this of zebra, the, the stallion will actually get between you and his, his ladies. So without you even noticing the size difference, you'll be able to see him quite clearly by the, his behavior. He'll try and get in between you. And uh, yes, they will definitely try and defend against uh, predators. Um, it really depends on, on, on the situation. You know, there's, there's a limit to how you can defend your youngster. If it's a pride of lions, it's very difficult to defend. And then it's all for themselves. But one lion or a leopard, most certainly, uh, a zebra might turn on one of them and they've got a very very powerful bite and they can kick very very effectively so I have seen male zebras chase leopards off chase hyenas off I've never seen them chase a lion off but I'm sure it happened but like I said it is also quite a risky business trying to defend your youngster and putting yourself in harm's way but it is their lineage That seems to be the boy there, doesn't it? Clifford, interesting question. Well, the zebra has always been known as the painted horse. Uh, they've got a much weaker back than horses. They are completely wild. Uh, I know you get wild horses in the world, but are they indigenously wild? Um, I don't know exactly how horses evolved, or I think they mainly were in Europe. I think they were a very similar sort of animal a long time ago, but through through breeding, through agriculture or domestication, uh, we've harnessed the horses we have today that are, are, are not ponies, they're more, well, you do still get ponies, but they, they're just a lot bigger, a lot stronger, and a lot more physical and able to work with what they do. So, and these guys have got stripes, but they are the same family. They're very, very similarly related, just continental drift many generations many 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 centuries of domestication has led zebras to be what they look like just like cows were probably very similar to buffalo at one point or something similar to a buffalo and they've been bred into the vast varieties of cows or cattle that you find these days it's like taylor was talking about that sandpaper raisin fruit earlier being very slightly fleshy and more seed it's the same with certain animals. They've been bred to a, a point where they now look the way they do, just like dogs are related to wolves. Some dogs you would look at and think, are you sure? But indeed they are. It's just through selective breeding we have these very interesting breeds of today. But I think at one stage zebras and horses would have sort of diverged from a very similar animal species. There's way too much similar about them, the digestion, the sort of social structure, the way they fight, uh, the hooves, everything like that, even appearance, are very, 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 very similar. I don't actually know too many differences apart from the fact is that zebras have never been domesticated and it's impossible to get them to do what you want to when, ze when horses are able to be broken in and used for, for grunt work and for riding. That is, I think, just through many, many, many years of domestication. Just like sheep. Sheep got domesticated because those sheep that didn't do well being domesticated left and got eaten. And those who did well being looked after by man, well, they perpetuated. So we're going to go from the open clearing of the plains to a tree and Ralph with another bird. Ah, is he just flown away? I can hear him calling. We had the bearded woodpecker doing it territorial knocking on this dead branch and as I say that I can just hear elephants down in the valley with their very characteristic 
The reason we stopped was because there was a bearded woodpecker doing that territorial knocking, which they normally do on a big dead tree like that. Sometimes it's a leadwood, sometimes it's a, a knob thorn, but it must be a nice resonating hollow tree. Um, and there was another one calling from just a little bit further on, and that's actually one of their territorial calls. But uh, the bearded woodpecker is the only one that does it, and it's a grrr, k -k 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 a very sort of typical sound that they make, and that is not them searching for food, it is actually them uh, calling to other um, woodpeckers in the area. And as I say, there was another one responding to it, so it was quite interesting there. Now, I know that uh, you said, I think it was to Steve, that you would like to see Tandi and Tlalamba. Well, I've decided to make my way into the area that she likes to hang around. And we're just driving along nice and slowly and seeing if we can pick up any little signs. Now, Adorian, you are asking if this is really live and if you can ask questions. Well, you just have, and I'm answering your question, which is absolutely 100%. We are live. There is nothing staged here. This is the wild, the bush in the greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. And you can send your questions and your comments on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or on the YouTube live chat. So it's just click on the link and you can then send through any questions and comments and uh, obviously not all of them gets put through to us as um, uh, as we are the guides uh, with a lot of questions come through but the, the questions that are most pertinent uh, to the subjects that we are looking at will then generally get sent through to us and especially if we are sitting with a lovely subject like an elephant or like we had there with a woodpecker ask us questions about birds and and woodpeckers or if we're sitting with an elephant ask us different questions about that but we're not going to answer random questions about random things when we're looking at something in particular so that's the idea and we want to get the debate going about different subjects in the wild why do things happen what happens in your part of the world etc etc so that's the idea and um, well it's not about just us telling you all the answers it's about sharing and debating uh, Dorian thank you brilliant I say fantastic and if you're a new viewer and you've just found out about how to join us well I'm stoked about that because that's just somebody else that's going to join us in the mornings and the afternoons um, or you can join us on a Saturday for the Safari Lives show which is a catch-up of all the week's happenings especially around the predators and anything very exciting that we've had during the week and it's just a two-hour show and that will then give you a full reap cap of what we have done during the week. So if you miss any of the other shows, you can then catch up on a Saturday. And well, I'm going to continue on towards Biffle's Hook Waterhole, but it seems that Taylor is already at one. Well, not one that you would probably find out in the bush, All right? And seen as though all the people that live at this house are on holiday, we might as well just scoop some of the leaves out while we're here. I said to you earlier that it was getting a little bit windy. And well, we better keep the pool clean. So this is where on hot summery days we play. There is much, I don't know even know what, what it is. I'm being told that I'm not doing a very good job at cleaning the leaves out of the pool. So we find all sorts of things in the swimming pool. We find frogs, water monitors, and then once just behind me, there was a hippo that decided to walk on in. And so that was very, very interesting. I don't think I'll be able to get all of these leaves and I bet tomorrow, yeah, when I come through, they'll all just be back in here. But this is the cleanest I've seen the pool for a long time. Sometimes you come here and there's all sorts of things living in it. But anyways, we actually came into this, well, this is the other accommodation that we have here at Wild Earth. And um, there's a pair of scops owls that live in the garden somewhere. And we've been hearing them call, calling every night and sometimes during the day as we drive past. So I think if we just scan the branches, we'll be lucky enough to find them. But something else that I thought was quite cool, and I talk about them often, it's the round leaf teak, except a much bigger one. Now, the only reason why this one is as tall as what it is is because the elephants 
can't get in here. Well, sometimes if you leave the gate open, then, well, then they do come on inside. But it's really, really quite nice. But even the trunk is not nearly as big as, as it can get. It's still quite a small one, probably not very old at all. But I have seen some monster round leaf teaks, and I'm sure there are probably a few in here. There's lots and lots and lots of different trees, from sickle bush to lots of bush willows. <laughs> Willow Wonder, yes, that's exactly the hippo that destroyed the decking. You can see this is actually all new over here. All these planks that have been redone over here. Because the, oh, well, not the elephant, but the hippo actually broke them and fell through. Uh, it's not very high, it's only less than a foot. And eventually Brent managed to, to lure it out. But you can see in winter why lots and lots of animals would want to come here. Please can you say that all again for me, Kirstie? I didn't... Right here, what came through? Oh, now, Oren, tourists can't stay at this camp because this is where we stay. And if you stay here, then we've got to sleep outside. And it's quite nice sleeping in a bed at night. Um, I, I love spending all day out with the animals, but I'd prefer not to cuddle with a lion or an elephant. So you can stay at Juma Private Game Reserve. Uh, you can stay in two camps. You can hire out. Gallego Camp or Voyatella Lodge and they're really amazing because they're kind of like some, not quite self-catering, that's the wrong word to use, but you can choose what food, what things you want to eat and there are chefs that prepare them for you and uh, it's beautiful. Maybe if, I think Steve's down at the dam, he can maybe give you a sneak peek of Voyatella Lodge if you're lucky, so stay tuned, perhaps he can do that for you. So, uh, oh no, apparently Steve has left the dam, but keep watching O-Ring, we'll, we'll have a little look, um, sometimes you get quite lucky and uh, see all sorts of animals. There's lots of spider webs and things around here, which is really quite nice. So I'm going to stop looking at the spider webs and I'm going to start staring up into the trees now to see if I can find, uh, well, a pair of scop owls. They're here. I know they're here. But I'm going to send you to somebody else who's not looking for owls. Yeah, well, we're always looking for owls. Owls would be nice. We had the pearl spotted and potentially even a barred owl at calling earlier, but we were too engrossed in our zebra conversation. We have left the striped animals, and we are back on our quest. I've been in touch with Ralph, he's headed up towards Biffletsuk Waterhole, so we will go in the other direction. Maybe even, if we are not lucky with anything soon, we might make a little mission down towards Chitwa for the sunset. How's that sound, Craig? Got some Aramark babblers that are just calling their noise. There you have the arrow mark babblers with that arrow shaped mark on the chest. Allomimetic behavior they're doing, the calling, the group bonding. There's a move through the vegetation in search of food as a unit. Well, it seems like Ralph has been lucky this afternoon at Buffelsuk. Let's go see what surprise he has for you. Well, look, we just had this little young male elephant who was um, really telling us that um, he was such a big man and uh, shouting the odds at us. He was really giving us a little bit of a show, putting his ears out and running at us. And now he's um, obviously realized that we're not going to play that game. And so he's now gone off and tried to catch up with the rest of his family. But there's another couple of elephants just off of uh, the road here, up in front of us. A mommy and a very small little calf just down there. Now, I'm not going to go too close to her because it's a very small little calf. And if she comes my way, well, that will be great. I might roll a little bit forward, Senzo, just to get us onto the ridge of this hill. But I won't go any closer than that because, as I say, she's got a very small little calf there. Okay, there she comes. I'll actually stop now. And you're going to see the little calf. So I don't want to disturb her. And we can see her very clearly. There's the little one. Hello. Looks like it's going for a drink. Still suckling from mom, obviously. And she looks like she wants to catch up with the rest of the herd. As a young male, obviously. And we've had a lot of elephants around recently. That's been very, very nice. 
Let me roll up and see if we can get a glimpse of her from behind before they disappear off into the thicket. We'll just go nice and slowly. That is always the key with elephants. Don't surprise them. Don't irritate them and don't drive up and you know close them up in a small space and it's generally excellent viewing if you just obey those small rules and give them the chance to allow you into their space as I say mommy with the little calf we will be a little bit careful because we don't want to make trouble but they can also sometimes just move off because there they go. It looks like they're probably going to be catching up with the rest of the herd, which seems to be moving in a almost directly northerly direction. So that's them. I'm going to continue on now, Senzo. Those ones have disappeared off into the bush. We're not too far from Biffles Hook Dam, so I am going to continue on. There's a nice water hole there. Maybe some of them will be coming for a drink, as I said earlier. So we're going to head... Oh, Senzo, there's some more behind. Ah, but we'll have to turn around that way. So I'm going to get the next turn and then we'll head back towards Biffles Hook. I think those elephants might have just come from there. So I'm just getting this next little road and then we're going to head through there. They've probably all just been down for a drink. So we have just missed them, I think. But maybe there's some more down there. Very often you have some of the younger males that like to linger around behind the herd and then uh, very often get left behind and you see them then running through the bush as they um, get told off or if they get left behind and when they realize that they've been left behind then they try and catch up again with with the rest of the group so we'll just head through there I love watching elephants, especially around water holes. It's always fascinating. Giraffe girl, the youngest elephant that I have ever seen was, um, it was probably about 15 minutes old. I didn't see the birth actually happening, but I got there when the elephant, the baby was lying on the ground and there was still the afterbirth and all of that. And mommy was throwing sand on her own belly, obviously with the pain of having just given birth. There was a lot of blood around and all of that, as you do get when you, uh, when you have animals giving birth. Um, so it was just a few minutes old and it was beautiful to see it almost had quite a pinky color now since i saying that he can see an elephant is it walking towards us okay it's walking on the wall so we've got some elephants in front of us that's great news but i can't race through the bush especially with elephants you've got to always just be cautious in your approach and we're actually approaching the dam from a different side that i've never come from is quite interesting. Maybe we can see them from a new position. And there's a couple of hippos that are normally in this little water hole. I'm just trying to get us through here. And then we can go down. And they very often come onto that side to drink, so it's actually a very nice way of this to come down and spot them from this side. Uh, maybe they've moved off already. Oh, there he is. There's a big one walking on the wall. I'm going to stop right here because that is a beautiful sight. Look at the hippo just in front. There's some leopards moving. Oh, not leopards. <laughs> elephants moving off to our left as well. And that is beautiful. Like I thought, an older bull walking around at the back, lingering. Awesome. There he goes. We just caught him at the end, but... And we'll wait for him to come through on the road, just behind those bushes there. He's going to pop out in a second. There he comes. Look at the light on him now. Good looking. There we go. That looks like a bull. And as I said, it's uh, quite regular, quite normal for the bulls to be following up behind a herd. You can also see the sort of the way that they walk as well. Very relaxed. 
Some of the best viewing animals when they're not in must. That's the problem. So we've obviously just missed them coming for a drink, but let's go forward here. Looks like we've got a couple of hippos still in the water hole. Let's just spot them from this side. There we are. Let's see. They'll show themselves. There we are. Hello, hippos. And this is one of the spots that um, Tandi and Salamba do like to walk around. So I'm quite happy just sitting here and waiting for a little bit and we see if, if she shows herself. Always just got to put yourself out there hey, and just wait around. But, well, this, it's, um, it's been quite a, a long time that I've been coming to Biffleshook Dam from about November. And each time I come, there's always been one bull in here. And uh, he was always quite a nervous character. And so much so that we called him Scuba Steve. Because he would just come up with his nostrils out and not show anything else. So it seems like he's relaxed a bit with vehicles around. And he's also now got himself a little companion. Look at that. And she was also nervous, uh, almost following his lead by just letting her nostrils come out, taking a breath and going under the water again and not showing themselves at all. But it seems like they've calmed down, maybe with a little bit of age. And they've relaxed with vehicles coming through here. I love it how they blow the air out, almost like whales, with a little bit of a spray of water as well. He looks quite sleepy. Now, Malinia, you say that hippos are your favorite. Uh, yeah, I definitely do like hippos. And one of the favorite things I do like about them, as I've said many times before, is that they generally go underwater, they tell each other jokes, and they come up laughing. It depends on how good the joke was, though, because I think Scuba Steve, he still needs to work on his comedy side. Because if you go to Chitwa Dam, very often, as soon as the hippos come up, they all do that. <laughs> and uh, laughing at the good jokes that they've got around at Chitwa. So I think uh, I'll scuba Steve. Uh, maybe he's not such a funny chap. Well, he doesn't have a sense of humor. And, well, he spends lots of time underwater. What he's doing, I don't know. But let's go on our way and see if we can find a predator around here somewhere. We'll leave scuba Steve and his companion... B. I'm sure it won't be too long and they'll be coming out of the water and going looking for some food. That being a good grass, a nice grazing area. Well, I'm going to continue the search for predators all the way into this evening. I can't wait. I'm sure we're going to find something exciting. Well, we found something. It is a spider that is terrified of us hiding in its little leaf lair. Isn't that very pretty? I don't know what spider that is. I don't think it's a hairy field spider. It must be something else. I think it belongs to the orb, one of the orb web, well, in the orb web family. Sorry, that's what I'm trying to say. Because it was making its web and we were trying to make it all look beautiful with a golden light behind it. And it was just really terrified of us. So it's decided to hide away. But obviously, that's where it takes a bit of shelter on a not so nice day. When it's too hot, if it gets too cold, all these different types of things. That's a very good spot to hide away there in some leaves. It looks like just two dead leaves that it's sort of strung together with a couple of pieces of silk. It's got a very intricate web, though. So it's even got some, some webbing around basically where it is. And then the rest of the web, which we can't really see too well, on and and a big an orbed shaped web. It's very, very pretty. It's a beautiful spider. Hasn't caught a meal yet, perhaps. It is preparing for the evening. Perhaps that's the case. How's my audio now, Kirst? I'm just trying to see. I'm looking at my pack. No. Okay, well, I'll, I'll fix my mic in a minute then when I'm not live. I need two hands for that. But um, very, very cool. And I think it's going to be quite happy tonight. It's getting chilly. Well, it's getting chillier. Sun is starting to go down. I think there's going to be a couple of midges. Uh, if we're lucky. Uh, well, if the spider's lucky, we'll get stuck on in there. Whee! Going for a bit of a ride. Now, I've got a couple of other things here. Firstly, I think there must have been some elephants that arrived in Ingers because I found this peanut shell. 
And we know elephants love peanuts. I'm obviously talking absolute nonsense. That's not true. I don't know. Someone was eating peanuts and has the shells on the floor. But I've got these two things. First one we're going to have a look at is this. This is aloe vera. For all the ladies out there that like to use sort of natural skin products, this is a great thing. You can see how it's sort of oozing at the moment. So if you've got any cuts or anything like that, you can just take that very sticky uh, sort of secretion and you can put it on your wounds. You can put it on your skin. If you get sunburned, pop it on. And then the other great thing, and it's how I stopped biting my nails as, as a kid. My mom, we had lots of aloes growing outside. Well, they were planted and then they grew every night. Every, and every morning she would put the aloe vera on my nails like that and off I'd go to school. Dare I bite my nails there, I'd get a very bitter taste in my mouth. So that works really, really well in South Africa. To wipe it on my pants now. We'll see if it comes off. Uh, I hope I don't... No, I have to go wash my hands again. Then I found this feather, <laughs> which is quite cool. Very pretty. But I have absolutely no idea who it belongs to. It's quite a big feather. I'm going to put my hand up just to show you in comparison. It's quite large. I don't think it comes from the wing. I think it might come from the breast of the animal. Or maybe on, on the back, sort of between the wings. But hashtag Safari Live. Let me know if you or any ideas of what you think it could be. It's very pretty, though. Huh? Sort of a cream color with those beautiful browns. Well... I'll give you a little bit of time to think, and I look forward to hearing uh, of your suggestions. Okie dokie. Well, very exciting things happening this afternoon. Rolf with the smallest elephant he's ever seen in his life. Uh, let's go and ask um, Steve if he's ever seen a really small elephant. I've seen very small elephants. I saw that elephant shortly after it gave birth that Tristan saw a few months ago. It is the cutest little thing ever. It has no idea what to do with this trunk thing. It's just this thing that it flips around. It is just too precious. Baby elephants are just, there's something about them. Babies in general, really, but baby elephants, oh my word. They can melt anyone's heart. And Jamie had that sighting of that young elephant that ended up falling down that little, little hill. And then mom and someone else rushing to pick it up. <laughs> yeah. So, well, we're going to head on down. Seeing as Ralph went to Buffelsook, uh, we were thinking of going there. But we communicated with the radio just as well. Otherwise, we both would have materialized at the same spot. One of the benefits of the radio. And we're going to slowly make our way past Treehouse Dam and then down towards Chitwa Waterhole in the southeast and see if we can get some elephants of our own coming down to drink. Wouldn't that be marvelous? Can you just hear that noise in the background of a red-crested Kohan? They're coming into the breeding season now. And quite often that call is followed by the suicide dive that they practice. They will fly up into the air and do this backward somersault and then f pull out of the backward somersault just in time to land on the ground. And the object of that is they're very camouflaged and the females and males are spread out over quite a large... Another one's calling far off in the distance, but you won't hear that. They fly up, they lie down, and the reason for that with their black on the belly flying up like that is the ladies see, they hear the call and they see this guy all over the place flying and then they come closer to the guy who seems to have the most sort of daring dive hopefully we'll see them as the winter months start to descend on us we will definitely see them doing their thing Mabel Taffy, yes birds sometimes do swoop down on on our heads um, I have only ever encountered that the other day by a pearl spotted owlet that was sitting on a branch and came straight from my head. It's quite funny. I think it had to do with the fact that David was on the back because everything seems to suit for Dave. Um, I've been dive bombed by blacksmith lapwings and crown lapwings, um, but that, they've got sort of nests in the open clearing, but I've never been dive bombed by any other bird from a nest, but it does happen, it does happen. Um, I'm trying to think of some examples but quite often uh, you can actually stress birds out by going close to the nest and they'll go away and can abandon the nest. So it's not ideal to fiddle with birds in their nests. 
because if they feel like their clutch has been um, compromised and there's not enough time left in the season, they won't lay another egg. And if their feed has been compromised, they might not come back. So it's one of the reasons why in the breeding season we don't play bird calls more than once at a time. You can really stress the breeding pair out and you can cause them to abandon their chicks and even their eggs. So very important ethical, very important ethical sort of thing to pay attention to there. If you just walk around playing bird calls all the time, not good not good especially for a breeding pair Craig you ever been dive bombed by a bird Starlings. Craig's been dive bombed by starlings they are quite sort of sort of in your face kind of birds so yeah starlings are the kind of bird that would do that but I've never been dive bombed by a starling but I can imagine them doing it Forktail Drongo is the kind of bird that would chase you away most definitely. Well, talking about birds, Taylor has got an answer for you on the feather. Well, I don't have an answer at all. I'm still very confused as to what feather I was looking at. But Kirsten's going to give me an answer now. Someone has guessed correctly, I think. I must try to remember this. Larry, you said that that feather was from its what? Left back wing. I was sitting up on the second tree. From It was from, it was from a pill spotted eyelid. Le yes, something along those lines at 10 p.m. last night. That's amazing. Congratulations. You win, Larry. That's exactly what happened. Are, are you watching me? Are there cameras around here? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Very funny. I think it might be a little bit too big for a, spot, a pearl spotted otter, but I like your joke, though. Uh, I like your joke. So, so we've got some tracks here. Now I'm actually trying to think, David, maybe they're lion tracks. Do you know why I say that? Because look here. See, look how small these ones are. These are definitely cat tracks, you can tell, because you can see a very, very clear. But translates to the back pad and then of course you've got the toes i wonder if this wasn't the sticks pride because i know they've got fairly young cubs mm, initially i'd thought leopard i thought oh okay he's been walking here and then i saw this one over here this footprint which is massive and i think i think this is from the sticks pride they're in an area where we don't normally drive i mean unless you're going to swerve out to avoid hitting something um, so they're fairly undisturbed in terms of tires and stuff like that, but you can see how the track has been destroyed. Look at that complete side of theirs. Actually, it looks like an impala or something has actually stepped into this lion track, and to me this looks like a big female footprint. There you can see some more toes, but the back of the track has completely worn away. So when were they here? Two mornings ago. Yes, two mornings ago. The Sticks Pride were around there, ate a wildebeest. So they obviously came around that way and then walked all the way towards a Gallego pad. Chris, do we have any more guesses as to what we think that feather is? Where have I put it? It's in my pocket somewhere. Here we go. Okay. Child of the universe, you said an owl and joy from Yong uh, Yong Kong, Hong Kong. <laughs> Oh, I'm so terrible today. Uh, you said from an Aramark babbler. I don't think an Aramark babbler. They're sort of more brown in colour um, than anything and a bit more grey. Um, Child of the Universe, I'm just trying to think what owl, though. I don't think this is from a spotted eagle owl. They're quite mottled. I don't think this would be from a rose eagle owl either. I'm wondering if it's maybe not from a nightjar. That's actually very pretty. I'm just trying to think. Or, yeah, no, it's also too, it's quite a big feather. Maybe a night jar. I have absolutely no idea. It's a very pretty feather, though. We'll take it back to camp, and we'll also ask Steve and Ralph and see what they have to say. But um, your guess is as good as mine, because I found it wedged on a tree. So I don't know if the wind just blew it up there or the bird flew through those branches, losing a feather. But it was quite nice. Ah, yeah. oh, Laura Moore and Paul, you said a hornbill? Now, I can see why you would have guessed hornbills, because they typically have those sort of um, white p uh, spots all the way down their back with black, but I don't think so. I don't think that that's come from, from a hornbill. 
I don't know. I'm thinking I'm thinking a nocturnal bird of sorts. I don't know why. Just those very mottled colours. Um, or, or a ground-dwelling bird of sorts. There's a very sort of ground... Maybe it's from a Franklin. Well, I don't know. Who knows? We'll try and figure it out together. We'll keep guessing. Try and put that in a safe spot. No, maybe my pocket's going to be the best bet. Okay, we're going to start heading towards the west now and, to, uh, and then slowly to the western corner of the open plains and see what we can find. And I have absolutely no idea who I'm sending you to across next. Well, everyone, I'm just backing up slightly because we've got a very big breeding herd here and um, it seemed like they were just coming straight towards where I was parked. So I was pretty much blocking their path. So I'm just giving them the path that they want and, in other words, giving them the right of way. So as long as we normally do that, well, there's lots of them, so we don't want to particularly get surrounded, especially when we're blocking the path that they were walking on. But um, now everybody can come past, file past in front of us, have a little look. Some of them are a little bit nervous, especially the ones with little calves. Hello, Mommy. This one's got very swollen mammary glands, even though she's got a bit of an older calf with her. And they all seem to be heading our way. Now, as I say, I don't want to get particularly surrounded by big elephants with babies if they're not in the mood for it. They seem to be quite relaxed. Now they're starting to feed. The little baby is having a drink from mummy. So they seem to be quite happy. Erin, um, the head of a fem of a of an elephant herd is is always a female. Yes, it's a matriarch. Now these elephants are all around us, everybody. So I'm just going to be speaking with a nice, soft tone, because we want them to know that we are friends, not foes. We've got youngsters. We've got elephants of all ages here. Yeah? We've got mummies of. And they've all got little calves. Hello, little one. This one coming right in front of our vehicle. Hello. Hello, you. You're curious, aren't you? Huh? And here comes a mommy with a little calf. See, always very important that they've got their space to move. So, yes, Erin, um, the head of a, of a group of elephants is called a matriarch. So it will be one female that is the leader and she will then sort of make all the final decisions. She's the one that normally leads the group and tells them when it's time to move off or when it's time to stay. And these elephants are moving quite quickly. I wonder if they're also heading up to where, towards where we just came from. They're heading in the exact same direction as those other elephants. And it's almost like they're doing a daily movement from um, one part of the park on a sort of southerly side up into the northerly side, which is going up into Biffle's Hook. I'm just going to maybe try and turn us a little bit. I think that's just about the majority of them that's moved now. Oh, but while I get us a better position, it seems Steve has found one of those prehistoric creatures. Very prehistoric. We have found ourselves at Twin Dams. And we found a beautiful monitor lizard that is enjoying the last rays of the afternoon sun. Those claws very adept climbers. Beautiful creature, in fact. Very powerful predator. They feed a lot on their own kind as well. Very good sense of smell when it comes to finding eggs and birds' nests. They're one of the biggest problems for crocodiles, searching out and finding the crocodile eggs. Lily, it is pretty big. I'm trying to think or sort of work out the size. Just over about a meter. 
A meter th two, meter three. Beautiful creature. There is another one, a little bit off to the left, but not as good a view. So we'll stay with this one. Beautiful. Got that sort of nice yellowish coloration on sort of the body there. A little bit longer nose. The rock monitor's got less of that yellow, and the nose is a bit more stubby. Very powerful that tail can flick. Very good for defense. And flick and kick you quite hit you quite hard. And those claws as well can gouge your skin. So not an animal you would want to go and pick up if you had the inclination to do so. He suddenly looked a little bit more intense, didn't it? Like what? You want to come and pick me up? <laughs> no, sir, we do not want to come and pick you up. But all in all, pretty camouflaged, sitting there just on the bank. You need to be, with large raptors flying in and around. Marshall eagle being one of the largest predators of these monitor lizards. The water monitor and the rock monitor, I've seen on many occasions. I mean, look how camouflaged it is from where we sit. Very camouflaged. So you need to be if you've got the eagle eyes of a large predator flying in the sky but also that's why they are quite close to the water if something big shadow looms overhead they'll quickly zoom into the water where they can swim very efficiently the sideward swiping of the tail Paulie yes the speckles are very very nice I do I think they, they're very pretty they add quite a nice dynamic to the coloration of the animal but obviously works very well for camouflage Whether it serves any other purpose, I'm unsure. Dory, I don't think so. You say you want to know if they raise the offspring. I don't think they do. Um, the only real sort of parental care reptile that I can think of, first of all, a crocodile will bring the, the youngsters into a sort of a nursery, but that's about the extent of it, and a python sort of look after the eggs and even the youngsters for a very short period of time but other than that I think most most uh, reptiles are, are very non-parental non-parental not not the parental kind but I do stand to be corrected there if anybody knows better than me there please feel free to comment oh, marvelous those claws they are phenomenal used very well for digging scratching up the crocodiles like to bury their eggs on the bank so they'll do very very well Maliana lizards will sleep in all sorts of different places they might find a crevice under some rocks they could sleep just under a bush or find a cavity in a tree um, it's not really safe for them to just sort of hang out there on the bank uh, but they probably find somewhere to sort of secret themselves away where they can have a proper little sleep because as the night time starts to cool down their body processes start to cool down as well and they don't move as quickly so if anything was moving around at nights to try and hunt them when the temperatures are colder it'd be more much easier to catch so they're sunning themselves to give them their last burst of energy probably before they go find sort of a favorite sort of spot to spend the night but by no means would it be the same spot all the time they move they move in relation to to the to their needs food water but there would have to be certain areas nearby be it logs or cavities or holes in the bank that would be needed for them for the evening are we going to move off from here and see if we can get a glimpse of the sunset from Chitra water hole but it seems as if Taylor has already lined hers up We've got a different kind of a sunset this evening. This time we've got golden backlit birds hovering around on a termite mound. Now there's virtual starlings and Cape Glossy starlings, yellow-billed hornbills, and I'm not really sure, maybe a couple of buffalo weavers in there too. 
but that termite mound must be open somewhere where they're all feeding. I can't think of any other reason why they'd all be down on the ground like that. And it's an awesome little bird party. Very nice to see. There's actually lots and lots of different types of birds all starting together. So I'm hoping the longer we stay here, the more we're going to see. And sometimes you can see exceptional bird parties, you know, especially when you get the gregarious birds moving in, like the uh, magpie shrikes or even the red bull buffalo weavers, all those southern grey-headed sparrows that we were looking at earlier. And they definitely can contribute to the size of a bird party. But I don't think they're going to be doing much flushing of food like bird parties typically do. I think they're all just going to feed on the ground now. It must be termites or ants. You can see they're competing. They're all chasing one another around. They're not very tolerant of, of each other. Well, just tolerant enough that they're all such a and feed. But that is just absolutely gorgeous. Now of course on bushwalk we don't have a big ambient mic like we have on the cars and I wish I was here in a vehicle because the sounds that the birds, all well, the sounds that are coming from the birds are just amazing. <laughs> Kenneth you said McCurdy's birdies. <laughs> I like that. That's quite funny. That's so stunning. <laughs> Trying to see if we can hear any sounds. Now I'm really hoping that Hokomori is going to wake up soon. I'm sure he's just sleeping close to camp. Hopefully he'll wake up and do a big rasping saw that we'll be able to hear. But that's so amazing. We'll keep walking on, on these open plains. It's very nice here. <laughs> see what else we can find. I'm just trying to think. We did have an Inyala, but the Inyala has escaped us, and my plan was that we were going to be below the Inyala, and we were going to get it silhouetted walking across the grass. That didn't happen. That We failed. The Inyala somehow got away from us. We're going to casually just walk around, see if we can get closer to any birds. Maybe we find a squirrel again, silhouetted by the sun. Who knows? Ralph has moved on from his elephants. I wonder what his plans are next. Yes, well, as I thought, those elephants were very much uh, on the move, so they didn't even stay for us to reposition. So I've moved on a little bit, trying to just find any sign of Tandi and Tlalamba. Now, we are in the area of the Gwari Pan, where she likes to hang out, which is right on our eastern boundary. And no sign of any tracks just yet. But sometimes, um, you know, it's actually not always the best to have tracks because they can almost send you on a wild goose chase and it was the other day when I was with Sebastian the where's he from Ghana the Ghanalese uh, Frenchman camera, camera operator uh, we had been driving around in circles following tracks and uh, we were quite frustrated because we weren't finding what we were looking for so I said to Sebastian today I'm not following any tracks we're just gonna look and well, we landed up finding um, Hukumuri, and so sometimes you just need to say that. You won't worry about the tracks because they can often lead you in the wrong direction because the animal has turned around in a circle or it's, you know, gone off the road and come back and done some zigzagging or whatever. And so you following those tracks, and often, like I've said, with my basset hound, he follows his nose and he follows the scent, but an animal could literally run in a massive circle and come around and be following him, and uh, he's following the trail of the animal, and uh, then he, he carries on like that. So, yeah, not always the way to find an animal is by uh, following the tracks um, but uh, it, it is obviously a good indication that there's an animal in the area so for the moment we haven't found any fresh tracks so I'm, but I'm not too worried about that I know that Tandy likes this area she's been found here regularly and that Sun is starting to dip towards the horizon and we've actually got the moonrise on one side. I want to find a nice spot to show you because we've got the moonrise on one side and the sunset on the other. So as we've got a nice spot here, I think Senzo will have to show you exactly what I'm talking about because it's beautiful. They're almost chasing each other. Here we go. This looks like a good sight. Nice and clear right about there. That's the one. 
There we go. So, what's that, Senzo? Where do I start? Where do you start? I say start on the moon, and then you can go uh, the other side to the sun. So look at that. It's heading towards full moon. It's maybe a night or two, and we're going to have full moon. And that is on waxing gibbous, as we would say, the phase of the moon at the moment. So anything over half moon um, is a gibbous moon, but it's a waxing gibbous. It's still getting bigger. And now you can pan across and show us the sunset, Senzo. That is very beautiful. And that's one side, and the sunset going on down on that side with some clouds in the area as well always makes for a very pretty sunset and very bright at the moment it's still got a little bit of a way to go if I look at that what's that it's probably about half an hour I would say oh and I can hear heavy thunder I think there's going to be a thunderstorm tonight so this is the calm before the storm Senzo let's have a look at all of these clouds it's booming now folks there's a lot of noise it almost sounds like there's blasting going on a big big thunderstorm in the making here it's very exciting and very uncharacteristic as well because this time of year we should definitely not be getting thunderstorms um, it should be drying up getting very dry not much rain and this should be happening in summer full summer we're almost uh, fully into winter all the months without an R in them. That's in May, you know, sort of being the, the back end of autumn. So we, we're just about into full winter now, and we're still getting rain around. So, fascinating. I wonder what's going to happen. Lots of rain possible, but um, speaking of water and animals that love it, Steve has got some of those. Mmm, the moon does affect water, affects all of us. I wonder how it affects elephants, considering we are 70-something percent water. Elephants must be something similar. I wonder if they have different moods and different behaviours because of the full moon. I know I certainly do. It's a nice small family. Having a drink. The little one on the right struggling a little bit with the trunk hasn't quite got the technique down the others are quite synchronized you can see that they're synchronized and the youngster is um not quite sure okay it's really funny when you see youngsters get frustrated with the trunk that they end up sticking their whole face into the water <laughs> it's always funny i do love spending time with elephants Hello Blake, you want to know what makes an elephant herd a breeding herd? And basically, females with their offspring make it a breeding herd. Um, if you get, uh, and the reason why we use the term breeding herd is because of the youngsters. Um, if you just talk about a group of elephants, if you don't know the sex, um, there can be some confusion. For example, if you see a group of male elephant together, we generally call them uh, a, a bachelor herd because they are boys or a bull with some who's a scary and when communicating that on a game drive with regards to walking or driving uh, bulls are generally quite docile and quite easy to approach whereas females with babies because of the youngsters can sometimes be or have different behaviors about them because of the youngsters and they need to behave in a certain way that protects the youngsters and moves with the youngsters and all of that so they can be a little bit more stressed out and can react to us a little bit more differently than, than the bulls can. You can see how the two of them, they're stopped with their leg in the air. You see the one's got its leg in the air. It's trying to make a decision right now. Trying to make a decision whether it should be coming past here. See it delayed drinking. There's a youngster trying to steal the water from it. I want some mum. See, she's the mum 
got the enlarged mammary glands, and she's definitely the one in charge. You can see how they're all moving with her. Melinia, indeed. The youngsters, young elephants for the first year and a half, two years, are very, very reliant to mum's milk to sustain them, not just for moisture, but for food. Um, while they start trying to figure out how to use that trunk, they're getting majority of their sustenance from the very nutritious milk that mum provides. But that is another reason why they can potentially be stressed, uh, because the mothers are having to provide lots and lots of good feeding for themselves. Um, so that they can provide the milk for the youngsters. So that is another reason why elephants can, breeding herds can be a little bit more funny than bulls. So important to understand breeding herds versus bulls. And they've just stopped. What are they doing? They're going to move off soon, I am sure. But it seems like Taylor has decided to take a load off. we just relaxing here on this bushwalk, Steve. We're not doing any work today. We're now watching the sun set. Isn't that gorgeous? And that's the most perfect sort of anvil-shaped cloud, don't you think, just behind it? And as uh, Ralph mentioned, that he could hear quite a bit of thunder brewing in the distance, so can we. So perhaps that cloud is going to turn into something a little bit, bit bigger and... Uh, well, create a bit of rain. It's slowly coming in from the southwest, so I'm not sure what what it is bringing. Thunder is going again. I don't think you'll be able to hear it with us, though. And it's all starting to look quite hazy, but that's stunning. Now, good news. Guess what? I heard Hukumori saw. Can you believe that that all worked out to plan? I said, as the sun goes down, I hope that we'll hear a leopard saw, and I did. Just down over there, we know it's Hukumuri. We know he was left there this morning, somewhere in the thicket. And then during the day, he definitely came to Galago Pan for a little drink of water. And now he's moving. So we're standing here on the edge of quarantine. We're not going to go uh, go looking for him because it's starting to get a little bit dark now. So we'll wait. I can actually hear Rolf racing on and trying to get as close as he can to come and help us. But he has two routes that he walks. <laughs> One of them is straight through camp and basically right past the, the room that I came out of earlier today to start the show. Or he'll walk on the other side of the drainage line and then come out past the tent in James's little little cabin and then go this way around. So we're just going to keep an eye out and scan around here. And, uh, well, hope that we can hear him soar once more. But I can hear Rolf coming in hot. <laughs> He's not wasting any time. I agree, Paula. Let's find a leopard. Let's do it. I'm going to try and wave Rolf down when I see him. Maybe he won't even stop. I'll just dramatically point like that. But I think what he should do is go and check Gallagher Road. Maybe just pop onto Gallagher Shortcut just to check a little bit. And we'll stand by here and see. Hopefully birds will help us or we'll either just physically see him walking around. Then he's not too far away. Right. Steve is having all the fun today with lots and lots of different animals, and it seems like the hippos are entertaining him. You always need to talk about the hippos when at Chitwood Waterhole. They are always a bundle of joy, and this group of youngsters has been splashing around, scaring the Egyptian geese. <laughs> They're having lots of fun. James was talking about them last night. And how many? I think he said there were 12. 12 youngsters. They are formidable looking creatures, aren't they? <laughs> So for those of you who have not been informed, Mr. James Hendry has left for Johannesburg this morning, this afternoon. He's flying off to the Caymans for the grand opening of Dive Live. Not sure exactly the dates. And then he's going to enjoy himself some time in New York, I believe. 2nd of June is the opening. And then uh, he's going to enjoy some time in New York followed by some off time down back in South Africa. Well-deserved leave. 
Not sure if he told any of you out there, but if he didn't, it was a nice silent disappearance. You can probably hear the cacophony of Egyptian geese all around us. They have grown quite drastically in numbers since I arrived here in January. See the waves by the hippos created there. Kathy, I don't know any jokes, and if I do did, I'm not sure if the hippos would understand. You know, maybe in about 10, 15 minutes they will start laughing. Probably at anything we say. There we go. I think they're too busy playing with each other to be listening anyway. I've spotted some of the water buck coming down there, Craig, to the left. We'll probably be able to see them in a moment. Coming down just between the trees up there. there you can see a youngster. There's one of the youngsters, two of the youngsters. They are growing so quickly. Another Egyptian goose in the foreground feeding. Now, following mum, mum is somewhere there. Saw her before, there she is. Oh, there's some lovely thunder in the distance. I'm not sure if you can hear that, it's rumbling quite far off to our south. Mean and moon, no. Hippos cannot survive without water. They've evolved to live in water. And uh, if they are not able to sort of saturate their body every day or submerge themselves, they will dry out and it will lead to their death. Um, not only do they need to drink water like all the other mammals and animals we see around, they physically have to get themselves wet. So, yes, no, they would not last very long. That's one of the sort of the downsides of being a hippo as well evolved as they are and how many adaptations they have that have sort of pushed them forward in the evolutionary perspective the one that holds them back is their dependency on water without which they will their skin will desiccate and dry out and i don't actually know how long they would last without the water i wouldn't say it'd be too long they can walk quite far so if a water hole does dry out they will move in vast distances in search of another one. Well, it seems as if Ralph has stolen my thunder. Well, thanks to Taylor for giving us the heads up that um, we had a leopard <laughs> calling in the area. So we raced down to where she, she said it was coming from. And surprise, surprise, it looks like we've got Hukumuri. So wonderful. He is now sleeping out in the open and one of the only times that you find a leopard very easily when they're out on the road. So... Thank you, Taylor. Much appreciated. I have and I will return the favour in future. And that uh, is important between guides. We need to share the knowledge and share what, uh, what is going on around us. Especially if you're out on foot, you hear it much easier than when you're driving around. So uh, if you can tell one of the vehicles that there's something happening close by and they can quickly race there, well, that's exactly the kind of clues that we're looking for. It's nice to see his paw pads from this angle as well. Beautiful. And I'm sure it won't be too long and he'll be getting up. I don't know if he's drunk already. Oh, hello. He's sitting up now. So you can see that very clear 3-3 three, three, uh, spot pattern on his whiskers. And that's now confirmed for me. I just looked at him um, as we arrived and it looked like him, but now it's confirmed. That spot pattern of 3-3. Three, three. 
He's a good looking cat, isn't he? A little bit irritated with the flies around. And everyone, I am just exci as excited as you are to see Hukumuri. I've been uh, looking for him for a few days and just missing him. So I'm glad I finally caught up with him now as well. I'm sure he's probably come out f from sleeping somewhere nearby. Steve said earlier at about lunchtime he heard monkeys alarm calling near to um, at the at Galago Lodge, sort of, but towards Voyatella Dam, but he said it was quite quick. So I don't know if he just made a brief appearance and then the monkeys couldn't see him anymore, um, but I'm pretty sure they were, they were alarming at him. And now Taylor's picked up the rasping that he's been doing. So he's obviously been sleeping somewhere in the thickets here. Um, pretty difficult to find him when they're like that. And then uh, now as the sun's gone to a, towards the horizon, starting to get a bit cooler, he's decided to come out. Now I don't know if he's been for a drink already and he's come down here or if he's still going to go for one, but he's right near to Galago Pan. So there's every chance we might get him going for a drink, but for the moment he's still a little bit dozy. Looks like he's still got half a full belly. But, well, that's going to be us for the rest of the evening, if we can keep up with him. But it seems like Steve over at Chitwa has got one of those very pretty birds. We have got a magnificent bird in the name form of the saddle billed stork. And it is a male. You can tell that by that little yellow spot just under the chin. Beautiful. Pink knees, the purpose of which I have no idea. Craig, why do you think they've got pink knees? It's very strange, isn't it? Pink feet, pink knees. Busy doing the, often the daily grooming process, the preening. Birds will do this every single day, very deliberate cleaning of the feathers, especially the flight feathers. And zipping them back again, any barbs that have come undone. A little bit of a belly scratch. Mario is a very cool looking bird. It's one of the, the, the large storks we find around. They are very, well, they, I think they're regarded as, as threatened or near endangered. Um, there's not many breeding pairs left in the Kruger National Park area. They're very easy to identify by the color. The name Saddle Build Stalk, you can see that yellow on the top of the beak. Looks like a saddle on top, obviously. Maliana, no, they're not related to flamingos. Flamingos are very unique species onto their own. Storks are, are very different. I am trying to think now the differences, really. I mean, the flamingo is uh, a bird that's able to to sort of... The, the, the bill opens the opposite way. Um, it's the only bird I know that's able to do that. They're a filter feeder, and their beak actually opens, or their bill opens top... The top beak moves away from the bottom beak rather than most birds the bottom moves down so very very interesting in their behavior how they walk around in the salt pans and they filter feed all of different types of of uh, if they're the greater flamingo they're feeding on on the phytoplankton and if they are the lesser flamingo they're feeding on zooplankton so they're feeding on different very small specimens in the vegetable or in the salt pans and that's also what gives them their pink coloration The waterbuck family just behind as they climb up onto the termite mound there, Crago. Lots and lots of little youngsters. And they are feeding on the juicy, juicy grass provided by the termite mound. 
those little youngsters there are probably nearly weaned. They're starting to feed more on vegetation and they're learning that the best, sweetest stuff is actually on the termite mound, which is a good, good thing to learn from an early age. High nutrients, good quality food. And if a certain cat was nearby, I'm sure one of these young waterbuck would feature very high on his menu. Let's go and see what Ralph thinks. Yes, well, we're still with a very sleepy cat here. He's uh, just having a look around every now and then, and then just flops his head back down. A little bit of stretching going on, which is always a good sign that he might go on the move just now. And also a bit of rasping that uh, happened earlier. I haven't seen him or heard him rasping since we've got here, but that's a good sign that he might be getting ready to go on the move. But his eyes are still a little bit heavy. Now, Victoria, who's a new viewer, thank you for joining us, and thanks for sending your question through. Uh, the spot pattern I'm talking about, I'm going to ask Senzo to go in nice and closely there, because leopards can look very similar uh, indeed. And if you look just above the whisker line there, you've got three dots that are just to the left uh, on his right. But as we're looking at the screen, just to the left of his nose, of his nostril, you've got three dots there at the top, that first little line of dots, one, two, three, and you see that. And on the other side of his nostril, you will also have that, so on the right-hand side, but we can't see it at the moment. So if we've got leopards that are, th there's no major characteristics about them that we can't tell, maybe he's got half a tail, or he's got half an ear, or a very big scar on his face, um, then we use these spot patterns. So we go very close in there, and Hukumuri, this one in particular, he's got a spot pattern of three three so three on the left and three on the right and um, if, if we go to Tingana which is another individual male that we've got here he's got five 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 spots on the left five spots on the right and uh, there's another there's a female uh, a young female that likes to hang around Hukumuri um, and her name's Shudulu um, she's got also a five five spot pattern so you can have all sorts of different ratios you can have a five three you can have a four three a five four and all sorts but it's just a closer or a more in-depth way of being able to identify individual um, leopards, uh, especially if you're not being able to see any of those uh, unusual characteristics that would obviously lead you quite easily to an answer as well. So that's what we use in terms of spot pattern. Obviously, we can also look at the different rosettes that form different patterns on the side of them as well, because sometimes you get like a little smiley face type look um, especially coming up towards the shoulder part over there. You can have different little patterns that you could then, uh, if you take photos or if you take screenshots uh, off the video that we're busy giving you now, you can then also make little patterns that would then lead you towards uh, which individual it is. Now, we're not going anywhere, and we're going to sit here with Hukumuri and see what he gets up to. I'm hoping he might even go for a hunt. I think that sounds splendid, but look at how the sky is changing. There is definitely something brewing out this evening. I don't know what it's going to be, what it's going to turn into, if it's going to be, you know, maybe just the run of the mill thunderstorm, a quick downpour, and then off it goes, or if the rain is going to settle in. Now, I know it was supposed to rain this morning, in fact. Remember, we put the rain roofs on and everything, and... Rexon even told us that it was pouring with rain in Kluvakani, which is not too far from here. And he says we better be, well, we better make sure that we, you know, don't get rained on and we're all ready. And then it didn't. It cleared and then the clouds came around again. And we've had a beautiful day. And so we played cricket outside. Obviously, when no one plays indoor cricket I'm out here in the wild. <laughs> but it was, um, it was interesting. It was a little bit overcast, but it definitely didn't feel like it was going to rain at all. Now, unfortunately, with all this cloud cover, 
it means that the light is disappearing a lot quicker than we would have hoped. I reckon the fellas on the vehicles are going to have to put the infrared lights on sooner than uh, they would have thought too. But so we're going to probably head on home now, get away from the storm. And, um, well, we'll see you tomorrow morning. No, I won't. I'm sleeping in. But um, somebody else that will see you tomorrow morning is Steve, and he's with the water bike. <laughs> mm, thanks, Taylor. Get out of the storm. It seems to be coming quite quickly from the south. We might start moving back ourselves, but... This waterbuck male is very interested in that female. And the kids are watching on. Even there was some mounting in the kids a moment ago as they were doing what daddy was doing or trying to figure out what game dad was playing. He's been following that female since, since we first saw them. He's tried to mount a few times, but she keeps moving away. You can clearly see the intention. You see how he tests with the leg underneath. Quite characteristic for water buck. A lot of other species do it as well, such as sable and road antelope. There we go, the youngsters are they want to play too. Interesting, the color difference between some of those youngsters there with the age. Probably only a month or two in between, but the color much different from that very, very tawny brown. You see, still got it on the forehead to that very gray coloration. That male wants to be part of the action as well. Uncle Freddy, I think that's a good question. I mean, I've seen domestic cattle, uh, whenever they see a storm approaching, lie down and sort of shelter the ground underneath them so they've got a nice dry spot to sit. Um, I don't know if wild animals seem to do something similar. I mean, you do see buffalo sit down, but it's just there's a certain time of day when they start sitting down and doing their ruminations. Um, but I think animals are aware of the storm. Whether they do anything about it from time to time is hard to say. But, you know, there's nothing really they can do about it anyway. They're going to be caught in it. They can't decide to go put on a roof or go shelter underneath some form of car park, carport or something. So, I don't know. It's a good question, though. Tom, I'm not sure. I don't know if... I mean, every now and again you see lions and leopards looking up at vultures as they're flying because the vultures can attract them or guide them to food. But you never, I've never noticed any, any animal kind of longing, looking into the sky, thinking, wow, that looks like a cartoon character. <laughs> that looks like something. I don't know. Maybe they do. Maybe they do while we're not, while we're not watching. Um, I saw a monkey last night. I was off... And I walked out of camp and I saw a monkey sitting on top of a tree and I stopped to have a look at him thinking maybe he's looking at a leopard. And he was just watching the sky and sort of looking at the sun in the distance. And that was, you know, provoked a few thoughts in my head. Like, is he actually watching the sky? Is he, is he like having a moment with himself there? You know, a little bit of a, a silent moment with himself. It's interesting. Not sure. Okay, Craig, let's move on. The storm does seem to be moving in from the south. So we're going to start heading a little bit closer to home where it will make it a little bit easier. There we go, you can see it looming. It'll be a bit easier to, to deal with if we do. It does suddenly open up. Ralph, who is quite close to home, who moved into the area we were working earlier, is still with Hukumuri. Let's see if he's still sleeping. Well, he's got his eyes open, but he's, uh, he is still very relaxed. Just chasing flies every now and then having a look around, flicking his ears, panting away, not really doing too much. 
And while we're sitting here, we're hearing all sorts of bird life. You can hear the noisy Natal spurfowl. We've got the very chatty starlings. And we've got the odd chagra. And it's all heading towards night time with these clouds moving in as well. It's going to be quite a dark night, even though we did have that almost full moon. I think with these clouds moving in now, it's going to be a dark night. And so actually much better for hunting for the predators. Because when you have that full moon, it's very light. And the prey animals, like or the antelope, they can then quite easily spot the the, or much easier, should I say, they can spot the predators then coming in. And when it's dark, those are the best nights for the predators. Makes it a lot easier for them because they can still see much better than the antelope at night. So, Hukamuri, what are you going to get up to tonight? Josh, uh, the leopards don't, uh, I've never had a leopard jump onto my vehicle. Um, they have moved right next to us. They've moved right in front of the vehicle. They move right past us. Um, when I was training students in a game reserve not too far from here, I had a, a leopard that sprayed a bush that was right next to our vehicle. And, um, you know, we often have these tracker seats in the front. And the student that was sitting on the tracker seat, he got wet uh, from the leopard spraying on the bush next to the vehicle. So that's about as close as I've come to a, a leopard jumping on the bonnet, um, literally spraying uh, the student sitting on the bonnet um, so he will never forget it he will probably never be closer to a leopard and he'll probably remember that smell for the rest of his life as well I know there's particular things that happen when you're out in the bush that you'll never forget and uh, well I'm sure that that student and that was one of those moments for him now Hukumuri is one of these special animals as well that um, I think he is also going to give me some special memories in the times to come. I'm still quite a newbie in this part of the world. I haven't spent too much time in the Sabi Sands, so I'm very excited at uh, the prospects of spending time with these particular animals. Getting to know them, getting to know their movements, getting to know the different uh, spots that they like hanging out and where they're hoisting their kills etc and um, I'm quite interested in this um, in this little relationship that's blossoming between Hukumuri and Shudulu. Now I've just got some other people that have uh, also shown some interest in coming into the spot so I'm just going to chat with them quickly on the radio. Um, yeah, you can either come down on Vubu or you can come down Galago Shortcut um, and then, you know, towards uh, Galago Pan. But let me know and I can try and direct you in. Okay, copy, no problem. Yeah, so there's another vehicle on the way in with some guests. I think they're from Australia. They want to come and have a look at at, these, at this beautiful cat here. Uh, no, he's uh, stationary just to the east of Galagapan. Um, yeah, he's Lala Panze on the road riding around. Yeah, Kumuri, that was a nice little yawn he gave us. As I say, it's not a bad thing to see him doing that. A little bit of activity, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking that he's going to be uh, getting active soon. Now, we're going to be swapping over to infrared or our night vision, because we're losing light. And there, Senzo has just swapped across. So that is the reason why you see it a little bit black and white, um, because with the normal camera, it's pretty much like the prey species. There's not enough light, and then you don't get to see very clearly, and we'd have to put the spotlight on him, which uh, then does disturb him a little bit, um, and, and the animals around as well. Now, what you're seeing on your screen um, is, is very 
much lighted, but uh, we don't need to use a spotlight. And I actually, when I'm looking at him with my naked eye, uh, he could be totally in the dark, but you'll see him clearly on your screen. So sometimes, every now and then, I might need to use my spotlight just to relocate him or so on. Obviously not if he's lying down like this, because we'll very easily see where he is. But if he's moving around um, and, and potentially walking through the bush, then I just use the spotlight just to relocate him and just to help Senzo then put the camera on him with the infrared or night vision. But for the moment, it's a, what we call a flat cat. Not really doing too much. And even with the infrared, you can see those flies buzzing around his ear. Meg, um, you know that rain and storms can actually assist predators because um, it does dampen sounds, noises, and it also does um, dampen smells. So uh, predators can actually use rain and storms to their advantage if they are up to going out and hunting at that time. But I know of lots of predators that have um, taken down prey in the midst of a storm. Uh, as I say, it almost seems a little bit easier for them. So yes, they will go out and hunt in a storm. It's actually a good idea. And look at that, he's still chasing those flies, which must be quite irritating. And at least now with the sun setting, they should actually start giving him some peace uh, in the next half an hour or so. And that's when he'll probably um, also get up and be active. So all we can do is hope. He doesn't seem to be very skinny, and we know that it wasn't long ago that he um, killed a warthog that was with Taylor. So it's not as if he is starving, but he could go hunting. Kenny, um, I don't think that leopards will recognize their names, no. Uh, and in fact, I think it's just for us as humans to be able to um, call the animals different names. But for them, um, yeah, the names that we give them, I don't think they um, uh, worry about that in any way whatsoever. So I know that it would be a nice thing to, to call his name and he'd maybe look up and look at us, but... Um, yeah, and the animals out here, they're in the bush, and I think they just recognize smells and sight of animals more so than uh, any kind of name, um, because for them, those are the highest parts of the, the, the biggest senses that they will be using. So, for instance, Hukumuri will call, he'll rasp, and he'll also mark the ground um, and bushes. Um, he'll spray urine on, on the bushes, and he'll also mark with his claws on different branches and, and tree trunks and so on. Lions are the ones that do that the most, but leopards can also mark with their claws as well. But generally it's about that smell that he leaves lying around with his urine. So other leopards that come through, they'll smell that urine and they'll know that it's a particular male that's in the area or female, and then they'll be able to follow up through the smell mostly or olfactory sense. Um, and so that's what they use the most. And so, for instance, Hukumuri has been following um, Shudulu, um, a young female around, who I would say is probably um, between four and six years old. And um, so she's a young, reasonably young leopard, but um, he's been uh, sort of courting her and mating with her as well and he would be following the very clear smell of her around she's also been marking and she does also rasp every now and then it's a slightly different call to that of a male not really as loud and not quite as hoarse it's difficult to tell between them unless you hear a lot of leopards calling you can just tell the difference between a male and a female um, leopard rasp. It's very difficult though, and also sometimes you can have males that don't really want to be shouting very loud. So it can be a bit softer. Right, so let's 
just hope that Hukumuri does give us a show and at least go for a drink. Well, anyway, that's what I'm going to sit here and hope for. Okay, up to you. Hello, and back with us. We are back on Druma, Vuyatela, and we are meandering through the Mulwati drainage system, which is a very nice area to find something moving along. I have yet to find a cat or a leopard walking down here, but we've many times had their tracks. And this, if we continue up this, is probably where Ralph is with Hukumuri, further towards our Juma Lodge itself, Utella Camp itself. So we're hoping something will pop out. I've had the Unkuhumas in here, the Lion Pride, we've had the Birmingham boys in here, the Evokers. Because this drainage system goes all the way south down to Mala Mala. So it's quite a productive sort of area. And lots of animals will utilize it. It's nice and soft. On either side of it is a perfect habitat for all sorts of animals. On Bushwalk this morning, I w would have discussed it with you. That's where we found those Nyala that were interested in each other. They were enjoying a little bit of the long grass in the shadow of the drainage system. Also lots of birds, ground nesting birds, the impala are moving through. Daka love this kind of area, bushbuck. And obviously monkeys and baboons will be frequenting the tall trees in and around these systems. So very, very important from an ecological point of view. Josh, I don't. I don't keep them off. They, they come. The flies, they come, and I've learned to just ignore them. Sometimes you can't. It just gets a little bit annoying. But um, you try and just ignore the fly. But the mosquitoes, sometimes we add repellent to our skin. I'm not a big fan of it, though, to keep them away. Uh, but the mosquitoes are only really a problem after we've had some rainfall. So as winter draws nearer, they should be disappearing, but we keep getting these little bursts of rain, which then leads to an outbreak of mosquitoes again. And um, yes, they do bite us, but we do try and avoid being bitten. I have left my jacket at home. That's why I'm looking so stark as on my arms. I had it attached to my bag after my walk this morning. I took it off my bed to place some books inside and I must have left it on my bed. Okay, well, we are in quite a bad signal area because of the drainage system. While we try and navigate these gremlins, let's go back over to Ralph. So everyone, I'm just making space for another vehicle that also wants to come and have a look here. So I'm just putting my nose in here to get out of his way a little bit. All right there. There we go. Okay, now we can see them nicely. Just want to check that they've got enough room. I might need to go forward a little bit. Let me just go forward slightly. There we go. There we go. Okay, there's it. So obviously, as I was saying about the infrared, obviously with the guests behind us, they won't be able to see the leopard without the spotlight. So that's why you're seeing that as well now. Now, show me, um, yes, you're right. Leopards do pant when it's hot. They've also got a very high metabolism. So that means that they digest their food very quickly, but that makes them pant a lot. When it's cold, they don't pant as much. Um, I've just got someone on the radio. Oh, that's it. They're answering for me. That's good. So you see how he's panting. It is still a little bit warm. Um, and as it gets a bit later, you might see that he pants a bit less. But um, they always do pant a little bit because uh, 
Well, leopards have quite a high metabolism. And if you've ever heard a lion come past your tent at night, which I have many times, and I, they've even come past me when I've been sleeping on the ground, um, one of the first things that has actually alluded me to their presence is the very deep panting that they do, like a and that's actually how I knew the animal was there. So it's actually a very normal thing for predators and large cats to do. There's a lot of panting. I'm just hoping that he's going to get up and go for a drink rather soon. Now, Malaika, the, the light doesn't particularly bother the leopards too much. It's mostly the daytime animals or the diurnal animals that um, really do get bothered by it. So, you see there, he will look almost directly into the light and not have too much of a, of a difference or change. But, you know, th this is one of the small little things that... Um, it's almost a oh look at that that was very pretty the small sacrifice um, in enabling people to be able to see these kind of predators in their natural habitat it's he's going to move now i think he might go for a drink oh you're going to go in the thicket he might mark he's going to scratch now do a bit of urinating possibly even a poo and that's typical marking behavior there there he's urinating And he might, you see, wipe his feet in it. They do do that. It looks like he might just have a little bit more. And now I think he might make his way up towards the waterhole. Now, the point I was making was that, you know, people need to be able to see these animals because they come in here, they pay a lot of money for tourism. And it's one of the small little sacrifices that, uh, well, it's a slight disturbance in a small way but very, very little. Um, but you know what? It enables these animals to be protected in their natural habitat. So this vehicle just going to... Let's get up and go a bit closer now, everyone. Don't I? I'm sure he's going to go for a drink. So let's just back out here. Let's get up to the water and watch him there. Um, so, yes, I, I don't want my, my point to be misconstrued. What I'm saying is, is that there's a small sacrifice to be made with sometimes um, uh, with a, not a massive uh, or intrusive type of behavior with these animals, but with us being able to watch them. Where is he? Is he off to the side? Okay. Okay. I wonder if he's going to go back down there. I don't know if we're going to even be able to see him. I think he, he's maybe already been for a drink, eh? There he is going into the thickets there, heading towards the lodge. And we can't really go into that thicket there. Lots of stretching. He might get a little bit active now. He's rubbing his nose on a branch. That's also part of marking. Okay guys, I'm just moving just to try to relocate, just to get us into a better spot here. I just want to go around. Okay guys, so I'm just going to try and get in here closer, but while we just getting in here and see if we can do that, let's head you back on over to Steve. Maybe he's been able to find something else. Hmm, it's very thick stuff that, where Hukumuri is, so very difficult to navigate with a vehicle. Very easy for a leopard to just mission through there. And bear in mind, if he does go through there towards the lodge and around towards the dam, that's where all those Nyala and Kuru Impala and the baby zebra were. Uh-oh. Whether they're still in the same area, it's debatable. They might have moved off. 
hearing him call would have given away his position and um, definitely put them on alert. So we are, we have decided to come back towards the east. The storm seems to be south of us and moving steadily west. And we're going to have one last ditch effort today, Sunday, for Tandi and Tlalama. Obviously, we're not going to shine on them if we find them. We do have the IR lights available, but this is the time of night where we could find Tundi maybe just on her own moving, uh, maybe headed in and out of the area that they had tracks this morning. Who knows? I've had her right here once before, coming back in the evening with Ferg uh, behind us. We came through a little drainage depression that uh, she spent some time in back when Scott was with us here full time down in Juma. And we generally got her in this area for quite a few times. Um, she spent some time just up here as well the last few months. Josh, I don't think there's any difference in the color um, between male and female. What you do notice is the males are a little bit bigger, so they seem to be a bit more stretched in my opinion. So the spots seem to be slightly in my opinion further apart so there almost seems to be a little bit more gold to them than the black so you kind of in my when you first see a female and a male you kind of see like a little bit more dark in the female a little bit more golden in the male but that's just my opinion right now but they are pretty much the same there's just the size difference and each leopard is quite unique in their spots in their coloration uh, where they're positioned and all that sort of thing but um, they all look very very similar in how they are and it's only facial expressions and the spot pattern Ooh, there is a Nyala up ahead let's not blind him we can have a look at him with the IR light that works quite nicely he's going to move off though it's a beautiful evening Nyala bull it's not a breath of air Starlings in the background closing down for the night. So we're looking with the special light on the special camera, which enables us to see these animals in the darkness so as not to bother them with the spotlights. This is the time of day that the leopards like to move around. As you can see, Hukumuri is moving. Hopefully Ralph is able to, to find him again. And what antics oh, is he going to be up to? We have another Nyala up ahead about to cross the road, a female. Well, I wonder if scorpions are active all the time, um, but they do go through a sort of a, a, a form of torpor. Where, where they just slow down their behavior and they're a lot more active in, in, in summer months. Being an arthropod, temperature is a very important aspect for them. Um, in summer we find scorpions moving around a lot and that's a lot of the time when they do their mating. But they can be active at any time of year, but it is temperature related. So we don't see as many of them around now because they're basically quite ambush in their predatory ability they will sit and just wait for something to come past and then come out of their rock or bark or wherever it is that they might be hiding and then tackle the food but they are so well adapted that a scorpion can go for like an entire year without eating so you thought Hukumuri was patient the other day he only sat there for an hour and 40 minutes waiting for that warthog to come out where a scorpion can wait for a year it's a long time. That just made me very hungry, Craig. How about you? <laughs> they are very, very well adapted to water conservation, heat, temperature. Very, very well adapted. I haven't seen many scorpions at my time here. I don't know why that is. Um, I suppose other places I've worked have had a lot more rocks. Uh, a lot of scorpions do do very well in rocky habitats. That's not the road I wanted to take. 
We walked up here today. Let me try to stay on the road, shall I, Craig? I was busy looking down that road to see if we could spot anything. Quite often you see animals walking in the road, so it's always important to scan down them as you drive past. And um, let's see how Ralph is getting on if Okumori has managed to come out of the thickets. Well, the other vehicles are watching him. He's walking, uh, he's going along that sort of drainage line and heading straight towards Vuyatila Dam. So I'm just anticipating where he's going and I'm keeping in touch with those game viewers as well. And I'm, um, I'm just heading out in front of him so that he can head towards us and we'll have a nice uh, view of him as he, as he comes towards us. And they've just told me in my ear now, he is on his way exactly where I thought he might be. So. It might be perfect for us just to head there in front and then uh, we'll, we'll just come to the northern side of the Vuyatela Dam and also if you watch on the dam cam I'm sure that you will be able to see him uh, coming past there soon but we'll see him first um, and then he'll probably go up uh, just off of the side of the, the dry dam at the moment. Um, and he might go up to where the water is next to the dam cam and have a drink there. It, um, it didn't seem to have a drink at um, the uh, Galago pan. Now, I'm not sure there are some other vehicles here, but I uh, don't know if that's Steve, but I can see that might be uh, me you seeing on the dam cam. Um, I am flashing my light now, just waving it up and down. I'm just looking for my particular spot that I like to go in here at the um, water hole itself. So, don't go anywhere. We're going to watch Hukumuri coming towards us. Beautiful. Just going onto a particular spot here that I like. we we'll go down the side over here. And I'm sure he might even come through here after he comes and pays us a visit. Now, let's go through here and have a look. And Texan, one of the wonderful guides of Gallagher Lodge. He's just told me that he uh, that I did the right thing, that he's coming straight towards us. So we're now heading, you'll probably see on the dam cam, this is me coming towards you. Hello. Yes, I'm shining a light towards you guys. Where are you, Hukamuri? I'm just popping my nose over this side. I think somebody's just calling me on the radio, so I'm just going to answer. Is Ralph here? Charles, you looking for me? You're welcome to take a standby. Um, I'll probably be here for the next 15 minutes or so, but uh, yeah, um, and then I'll, I'll make way for you. So make your way so long. Um, he looks like he's coming out towards Vuyatela Dam itself. Um, so start making your way. Copy, that's great. Okay, now, oopsie, we've just got to see when he comes through. Tex, go for off. Tex, just want to check, have you still got visual on Okumuri? So we're looking up front here, this is the direction that he was moving, but we come quite far ahead of him. Ah, copy. Sorry, Aubrey, man. I thought it was Tex. Okay, so they've lost sight of him there, but he's still walking and they're up on the road now. So let's, um, let's just go and have a look. Now, Dorian, the dam cam, is a, a permanent uh, camera that is set up on one of our uh, little water holes, which is just off to my side here, and you can also get access to it. Um, Kirsten, can you tell me in my ear exactly how they can uh, watch on the dam cam? And I will tell you now, once Kirsten tells me.
Okay, so it's gone to wildearth.tv uh, website, and there you can click on the dam cam, and then you can see live what is happening here at the waterhole, um, which I'm just driving past. It's just off to my side, and this leopard might also be coming out to have a drink here quite shortly. So go on to the Wild Earth website, and then you'll be able to access that. Um, and it's one of these wonderful spots that we often have leopards coming past. There's hyenas, sometimes elephants, and all sorts happening. And we very often get from the viewers, they're telling us what has been happening here um, before we even get up in the morning. So, let's see if we can find this guy again. He's walking slowly through the bush here. Now, Josh, that's an interesting question. Do leopards ever catch fish? Well, I can tell you something, that I've actually watched them doing exactly that. Um, it was in the small little water holes. There's his eyes there. There he is. He's coming there. Yeah, I can see his eyes there. There he comes. Okay, so we're probably going to have him coming out now just over here. So, there he comes. So, yes, and I've actually witnessed leopards catching fish in small little water pans, especially when they start drying up. And then they, um, they start just grabbing them with their claws because it's quite easy then, you know. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to reverse up here and get ahead of him. Now that we know that he's popped out, see the scrub hairs and everything? It's just running through there. You had a look at it. Scrub here just ran in front of him. So I'm just going to back out and get in front of him, like I said. We just wanted to make sure that we hadn't, in fact, um, lost him and had crossed the road. But he is now definitely making his way where I thought he was going to. I just want to make sure. I thought there was a big log there. There it is. I was driven into it. So let's just quickly spin around and we'll get a nice view of him from the face coming towards us rather than his bum. It's much better that way, isn't it? There we are. Just come around here a little bit and then we can get a nice view on him from this side. We've got to be careful that we don't drive into an art fork hole because that would make us get stuck. Now, Shamal, thanks for your comment and uh, that you visited South Africa and, and you guys are really amazed how you can stream Safari Live. Well, that's exactly what we want to be doing because we want to bring this kind of atmosphere to everybody. Um, you know, we're very lucky that we can actually experience this live ourselves. But, um, well, for all of you wanting to get your African fix and your wildlife fix, uh, we do this twice a day, every single day of the year. So, oh, and I think I'm feeling some raindrops. Okamuri, did you feel that too? There's some rain starting, everybody. Big drops starting to fall. So it's heading towards the end of the game drive. It might be just in time. Uh, Hukumuri, though, he might continue on and uh, go for a bit of hunting. But I'm going to now try and get in, in front of him again. And hopefully this rain will just give us enough time uh, to see this guy walk up before he heads off into the bush. Just need to be careful, like I said, not to fall in an art fork burrow because uh, we get very easily stuck and sometimes you don't see these art fork burrows until you're in them, especially at night when you're driving off road. So I'm just trying to keep a little bit ahead of Hukumuri but also very mindful of the fact of trying not to get stuck in a burrow. <laughs> Let's now get a little bit further ahead of him so that he can walk towards us for a bit longer. Jojo, you're absolutely right. Hukamuri is quite used to the paparazzi and we're going to get a nice close view on him once again. Looks like he might be heading up towards uh, the dam cam or where the and the video is, there he is, look at that, the silent killer, but he's a very beautiful animal, isn't he? Wow, 
And I can also put my spot on him just so that we can see him a little bit better. Where is he? There he is. I just put the light just near to him, not directly on him, just so that it doesn't disturb him too much. That's nice. Almost bounce the light off the grass onto him, you know, and then it's not so disturbing, rather than shining it straight in his face. See, he's still got a rather large belly, hey? I don't think that he's going to be uh, chasing all sorts of things tonight. There's every chance, obviously, they're opportunistic hunters, so they can do, but, um, you know, he's not starving, so it's not like he's going to be taking lots of risks or chasing lots of animals down. I think he might be going up for a drink. There he goes, slowly up the side there. Now, everybody, wow, we were very lucky to see Hokomori, even if it is just at the end of the drive. And as I say, lots of rain coming down. Now, we are heading towards the end of the show. I want to say thank you to all the animals for all the appearances that they've made, especially the elephants and the leopards. Thanks to all the FC people. Thanks to the cam ops. Thanks to all the other guides. And most importantly, thanks to you, the viewers. Now, please join us again tomorrow morning for another Safari Live. Good night for now, and goodbye.